What's up? How are you? Season two finale today. Unbelievable. Boy, it went fast, didn't it? I, I don't agree. Really? It's been dragging out for you? I See, think it's so, been a haul. You well, kidding so me? obviously... I enjoy your company more than you enjoy mine. Now you draw, you're drawing that conclusion. Did I say anything about whether I enjoyed it or not? I'm just saying <laughs> it's been a long period of time. But that's what I get. From Twenty-six that. weeks. That's a I, that's a stretch. What, no. For me, spending time with my pal goes by a breeze. For you, look, look, I married thirty-one years. It went by in a flash. Well, I don't feel that way, but that doesn't diminish how I my my enjoyment of it. Maybe I'm savoring it. Okay. You know, you have a piece of uh -huh. chocolate, you you eat little bits to savor it, make it last. Maybe that's I my view. I rip it open and eat the whole goddamn thing all at once. Listen, we both can <laughs> we both can have agree to disagree and still yes, like the can. podcast. I'm not saying it's torture. Did I say I'm miserable? I listen. Uh. Never mind, but we have an incredible guest. I mean, incredible. Nobody, yeah. nobody. There's not a pad podcast, a soprano podcast for sure that has the guests that we have. No, of course not. Nobody has who we have and what we have. And today we've got one of the most favorite characters of all the soprano characters, for sure. Very beloved. Very beloved. Beloved. Yeah. Uh, he only was around for two seasons and then some guest spots. People love him, and rightfully so. He's a lovable guy. He just turned 74. He's very spry for 74. Very yeah, he's, spry. He's in, he looks good for 74. He's in good shape. Very Last sh year, the three of us, you, me, and him, went to Australia and did a seven-city tour. We were This year, we were supposed to go to uh, UK and Ireland. We hope to go there next year. We've been all around the country with Vinny. We toured in our live stage show, Conversation with the Sopranos, with, uh, with Vinny. And what I gave away the name now. But what, what a lot of people don't know about Vinny, I mean, of course, he's a great actor. He also has written plays. Uh, he's a musician. He sings. Broadway star. He's been on Broadway, TV, over 100 movies. I mean, this guy's the real deal. And he started late in life. Like you. Yep. It's not a late no. life. Let's bring him out. Come on down. Vinny Pastor. Vinny Pastor Big in pussy. the house. There he wow. is. Yeah. Wow. It feels like I'm down under again with you guys. Yeah. Big All pussy. Right. You know? When we was the last time we saw each other? Was it Australia? No. Rochester. Okay. Rochester. I think it was right. Rochester. Was it Rochester? Yeah. Uh, we did a show in Rochester. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm good. I'm good. I tell you something. This pandemic kind of scared me, but it also uh, it got me more centered. I mean, you know, my family and what what I want to do with my life. That's and good. Uh, I've been I've been pretty good. I've been uh, doing a lot of reading, which I haven't done in years. Uh, catching up on a lot of great movies, and uh, I'm starting to direct some theater now. You know, I'm what are you reading? Oh, uh, I read Steve McQueen's book, and every night I would watch a Steve McQueen movie. Wow. What's your nice. favorite one? Great Escape? No, my favorite movie is The Sand Pebbles with Steve. Oh, I've never yeah? seen that. Oh, you would love it, Michael. It's yeah. long, but you would love it, yeah. I, I like Papillon. Papillon, right? Papillon was great. great. Yeah. yeah, Steve McQueen ahead of his time. Cincinnati um, Kid, that's a good one. Cincinnati Kid. So um, uh, I'm he stole doing, Robert. Uh, he stole Robert Evans' wife, Ali McGraw. Ali McGraw, yeah, yeah. but he did the getaway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm with um, um, I'm doing that Chiller Fest, and there's a girl sitting opposite me and Chucky, and uh, Chucky Zito. Yeah, I don't even want to say her name because I make her look bad. But she was sitting there, and she had a picture of her and Steve McQueen that she was selling. So I said, "How do you know Steve?" She said, "I used to sleep with him." Wow, nice. That's a good <laughs> one. Said, I said, when? She said, when he was doing Le Mans. I said, oh, I read the book. He, uh, yeah, he fooled around a lot of girls. She says, no, nah, I was his girlfriend. I got the picture hanging in the other room. I'm not going to say who it is. Hey, I would buy that. Since she banged Steve McQueen, I would actually buy her autograph. There's girls with pictures of you you and them together, and they sell them, <laughs> and they say, I used to sleep with pussy. <laughs> well, I don't think they met me. They probably met some lesbian, not me. I, I, I like I pussy. Know, uh, 
That's our new T-shirt. It's great to see you. And uh, uh, so, listen, you started late, as I did. Just give us a little background. You started acting late. You've had huge success. What, what, what? You grew up uh, in New Rochelle. Let's go from the beginning. Tell us, tell, tell everybody out there what's what your story. I grew up in the town right over from Michael. Michael is a Mount Vernon. I grew up in New Rochelle. Uh, I'm right. older and than David Michael. Chase. David Chase. Was David from Chase. Mount yeah, David grew up in Mount Vernon as, as well, like ten minutes from my house. And um, you know, I was running nightclubs and um, I was doing a lot of rock and roll and. Uh, I think I used to sneak Michael in, you know, crazy horse, the bands, crazy horse, come see the bands. And, uh, then I got burnt out and, um, I, I became an actor. Uh, but then, uh, the Dylan brothers, Matt Dylan, Kevin Dylan, uh, get, yeah. suggested Kevin. to you. Kevin did. Yeah. Maddie suggested it. Maddie said to Kevin, we were sitting at my bar one night. We were watching, uh, Pope Greenwich village. And Maddie said, um, I can't bring him to Vic Ramos. Why don't you set him up with Charlie Massey? And Kevin sent me down to Astor Place. And Charlie Massey on uh, Curtis Brown Management, uh, he got mad at me. He says, look, and he lift, he held up some headshots. I could bring any one of these guys into my room. But you're here because of Kevin. Uh you know, and he was a little grumpy. He'd come back a month later, uh, give me a monologue. I didn't know what a monologue was. So I came back later, I, about a month later, did a monologue. And he was sending me out, but he also gave me some good advice. He said, go to NYU and start doing student films. So that was the beginning. What monologue did you do? The first monologue I ever did was from The Hustler. The Hustler? Whose monologue? Well, Fast Which Eddie. Fast Eddie's monologue. Well, yeah, this George C. Scott is in it. As oh, well yeah, as you're right. Yeah, Lisa. no, this was uh, um, um, about how the pool cue was like his arm. And, you know, that I can't remember it now. Oh, I, yeah. I, I actually, in class, I give it out to a lot of my students. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good monologue. monologue. Yeah. You know, Vinny, Steve, I'll tell you this. When we were teenagers in Mount Vernon, Vinny was kind of like a legend. Like, people knew who he was. They knew his club. Some Some kids would get in under the drinking age and hang out including me. And uh, we all thought he was a wise guy, you know, even though he wasn't, you know how people assume stuff. Cause he's Italian. He's kind of, he had this, you had a presence and you had a reputation. Yeah. And I always had my sports were, jacket on. You had a good jeans. reputation. People yeah. thought, you know, you had a, a stand up guy and a good guy, but he was like a legend. And you were how old when he let you into the ball? So I don't know. 16. No, he was 12. 10. 16, old? 17. The drinking age was 18, so it, was it wasn't 18. that big of a deal. I let a lot of young. They didn't bother us back then. So, so, you know. so Vin, so you, you go to, you start doing student films, you take some classes, you take acting yeah. classes? Yeah, I was studying um, at HB Studios, where I teach now, and I started studying with Tommy Waits, who actually was, It's uh, we're going to talk about Funhouse today, Tommy was on the set with me. Throughout Funhouse. Was, was that's actor. Thomas G. Waits, not Tom yeah. Waits, the singer. Thomas that, G. Waits yeah. is, was in, uh, um, what's the American movie Buffalo. without? He was in he Alpha did the play, Justice. Uh, and Justice for All, he was in without Justice, Pacino. Yeah, right, Justice He for did all. American Buffalo on, on Off Broadway without Pacino at the Circle in the Square, the original right. New York production. He's a really good Back guy, a good actor, and a good guy. I've met, I've met Tommy yeah. numerous times, and yeah. I. I really liked him a lot. Uh, yeah, and a good teacher, right? Wonderful, and he's still yeah. teaching. I mean, he taught Paulie Vario. I don't know if you guys know Paulie Vario. He taught him how to do Shakespeare. If you could teach him how to do Shakespeare, you could teach anybody. Gotcha. You know? so, 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 so you start working. You start working as an extra, right? You're in Goodfellas as an extra. No, I, I got no. I got lucky. I, the first job I did that was any significance was True Love, and I was Annabella Oscura's father. Nancy Savoca directed that. And Nancy Savoca directed it. Yeah. We shot in Morris Park. Uh, Aida Katura was in it. Ron El Eldard, uh, and it won Sundance. And that's and because of that, Ellen Ellen Lewis. She brought me in, and she says, you're not going to get a big part, but I'm going to put you in Goodfellas, and I got the man with the coat rack. Didn't you have a little some? Well, tell me about the Ray Leona story. Well, uh, Marty did 15 takes on that. It was a steady cam shot. 
Michael, in the Bamboo Lounge. All right. And by the time they got to me, it was the last part of the sequence. And um, Ray Liotta, uh, you know, he had to do a different take each way. And one time he smacked me. Smacked in the <laughs> face? Yeah. What'd you bring me these coats for? And he hit me. And Marty said, what'd you hit Vinny for? And I said, yeah, what'd you hit me for? He says, I felt like it. Wow. He probably wasn't on that Chantex back then. You know well, what I mean? Now yeah. he's on Chantex. He, you know, he's nervous from not smoking. What, what's Chantex? It's a drug that makes you stop smoking. And he does commercials for it. He does commercials for it. Uh, Vinny, well, when, uh, I'm trying to think when the first time we, did you, were you in handgun? Yeah. That, that might have been I, one of the first. I, no, well, I didn't meet you, but we did basketball got diaries together. Handgun, basketball diaries. Handgun. Uh, the deli. Yeah. The deli with uh, Gallagher. Yeah, we were in the same circle. Yeah. Then we wind up doing uh, Witness to the Mob. That was after the pilot. We did the Sopranos pilot, and then we did Witness to the Mob. We because we got picked up during Witness to the Mob. Oh, Christmas okay. time! I remember we were breaking shooting for Christmas right before the holiday. We got the go ahead for season season one. I remember because my first son was born and uh, right wow. around that time. And we were doing Witness to the Mob. Witness to the mob. Yeah, we were we worked together, you know, and uh, in the summer on this. I think the first time we actually worked together on the Sopranos was the summer because it was hot. It was yeah, hot, it was and then Witness to the mob came in late late fall the same year, ninety yeah. seven. I I met you the first time. I only auditioned twice in New York because I was living in Vegas. Uh, the what was it? The HBO movie. What was the movie? Uh, there was a guy. He was a German part. director. A German director. And I auditioned and you were out there in the waiting room. I saw you. You were loud, you put your glasses on, you were then you went into the I'm being dead serious. I'm not knocking you. Who you played who loud. directed Gotti? Robert Harmon from Harrison, New York. No, not no, Robert no. is my friend. It was no, the it other Gotti movie. The with other the mob with Tom Sizemore. Who directed that? Thaddeus O'Sullivan, he's from Ireland. That's him. That's the guy. Yeah, Not Germany. So, <laughs> all right, so I, I auditioned for that movie. <laughs> and you were in the waiting room, and I'm not knocking you. You were very loud, kind of disturbing. I was brand new. <laughs> disturbing? Was, uh, yeah, because you were talking a lot. Then you went into the room and auditioned before me. You, I mean, you auditioned for the same role. You were loud. You had your glasses on. I could hear your whole audition. You got it. I did that was the only time before The Sopranos that I had this year. You know, he, he, when he says the first time, I'm, Steve says, when I first met Steve on the set of Sopranos, I was cold and aloof and kind of high-hatted him. Now he's saying he met you the first time and you were loud and obnoxious. I was, I was loud and you know, obnoxious. He's That's always right. Mr. Perfect, I guess. And he, and we're all I, a bunch of assholes. I, in listen, world. I didn't say he was obnoxious. <laughs> you said that. I just said he was loud. You said he was obnoxious. I don't, I don't mind being you the most said he was middle. loud. You said he was uh, disruptive. I distracting. Did what did you say? I obnoxious. Obnoxious never came out of my mouth. Outrageous, you said. You said. What did you no, say? No, I did not. I just said he was loud. disturbing. You said disturbing. Okay. All right, Vinny. Let's move on. Well, well, well the, the question is, did I get the part? Yes, you got the part. And I did. So I, I guess it pays to be loud. That's, that's, that's and right. obnoxious, obviously. And obnoxious. Now, and obnoxious. So okay. <laughs> tell me how you read for The Sopranos. Tell me that's how you get the call, what's happening. By then, you've had work under your belt. It's 1990. Yeah. Who'd, who'd you audition for? So for Big Pussy? Yeah, I went in. Uh, Rob Coker was with uh, Abrams at the time, and uh, we just did Gotti. And uh, I got a call to go in to see George Ann walk in. And uh, me, Dominic, and Tony Sirico auditioned at the same time. It was, I don't know who was first, second, or third. Uh, but I went in to read for Big Pussy, and I think we were all reading for Big Pussy that afternoon. I think so. And did you know the nickname was Big Pussy? I mean, you knew they said no. Big Pussy? No, it said Sal. Sal. <laughs> yeah, it said Sal. Yeah. And then I found out I was Big Pussy. Uh, and, after. And you've been Big Pussy for your whole life. Ever now. since. And you Ever will since. be forever. Which is fine. Uh, well, you know, the other day I was talking to Chaz. 
Bombardieri and he said, you work, he went like this, you work one year on The Sopranos and everybody knows you more than anybody. One year you work. I said, no, I work two. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, because yeah. of the name. He said, because of the name. Oh, it's not just a name. Your performance, pe your beloved character. People loved Pussy. It was a heartbreaking, it was such a, I watched the finale, last, your last episode last night. It's such a shock. Even though we know he's working with the feds, seeing them kill you is such a big deal. A, because the audience loved you by then. B, because the guys loved you and it was so hard for them to do that, both as yeah. the character and as the actors, you know? Uh, yeah. It's so powerful. I think people just are not used to main characters of the show getting killed off, their favorite character getting killed off in season two. Never happened before. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. well, you know, like, this is a true story, and uh, we, we always bring this up. We're in Italy, and um, you, you were there, Michael, and uh, David uh, and Timmy uh, Van Patten created the scene that I was, there was a lookalike guy who was walking through Italy, and, and Tony Soprano, you guys thought it was me, well, um, that's why I was over there. So we're sitting around when David was doing his cameo in the coffee uh, outside. And Sirico says, you really going to get rid of Vinny? And David said to him, I'm not getting rid of Vinny. I'm getting rid of Big Pussy. He's got to go. But the so shot in Italy, they never used, right? No, no. I, I kind of think Timmy did that just to get me over there. Because he felt bad that everybody was going to Italy and I didn't go. Well, not everybody went. went. We had fun though. We had a good I day. went. I didn't go. Well, I don't think you were on the show yet. Were yes, you? Yes, I was. Yeah. The first day on the set, first day on this, my first day on the set, if you remember, I had a scene with Jim, you, uh, Tony Sirico, and, and Stevie Van Zant. You walked me into the back of the butcher shop. Earlier that day, you came to me and said, You're going to replace me. They're killing me off. <laughs> you told me that. You said, you're my replacement. You're killing me off. So that was before Italy. You yeah. knew already that they were killing you off. Yeah. How you knew yeah. was, how they you wanted because... to bring you to Italy, Steve. And I said that Steve doesn't travel well. And you might want to rethink that. <laughs> now I know you're good. We went to Australia. You were fine. Back then, I didn't know. It was a, there was a distance between us, a gulf. And... Yeah. Uh, I wasn't sure it was a good idea. It was an yeah. executive decision we made. Well, thank you. Thank you for not, for, for not, uh, you know. All right. <laughs> Finney, so how did you know besides Italy? I mean, you had been working, right? You did Hurricane with uh, Denzel Washington. You had been working. You think that had anything to do with it? Or that's no, just right. David, David called me after season one was totally aired. And he said, Vinny is David. Everybody wants to know where's pussy. That's exactly what he said to me. Because it was the scene when the, the second to the last episode where I took off and they didn't know why I went. Remember when, when Sirico tried to frisk me in, in, yeah. in, in the shivets? And, and, he, and David said, everybody in the internet wants to know where's pussy. Uh, well, we really don't know yet, but this is what we're thinking. And then he started to tell me what they were going to do. So you remember not, Steven but, Tyler had a t-shirt made from Aerosmith. Steven from Aerosmith. We did an appearance of Foxwoods and he showed up with a t-shirt. Pussy is not dead. Remember? Yes, I do remember that. And that yeah. became uh, a thing on the internet. Where's pussy? Where's yeah. pussy? Where's pussy? Yeah. Yeah. So what happened is that uh, David said, Vinny, um, you're going to be the rat. You're going to die, uh, but you're going to have a good season. And he said to me, I promise I'm going to uh, try to bring you back as much as possible. And he did. You know, he kept his word. Uh, you know, it was a ghost. But you had all different theories. You said uh, he saw me smoking weed at a concert. I think that's <laughs> why he killed me. You told me that. You told me that. Tony Sirico said, <laughs> you left the set one day to work with Danny Aiello, and that's when we knew you were going to get fired. I said, what? He said, you went up to David and said, I got to leave. Let Tony do my line. And David said, he's going to go. And I don't know if that's true. Nah, I don't think anything's true. That's the way the story went. It was nothing personal at all. You were yeah. the first series regular, you know, uh, I, I believe, of a, a series, a huge series to get killed off 
like Michael said, took the audience by surprise. And this is the thing, because I watched the episode, the finale. In most shows, uh, the audience wants the snitch to be killed. You know, they want him to be killed. This is a bad guy, ratted on everyone, kill him, kill him, kill him. You broke the audience's heart, Vinny. I, I, people were crying. Yeah. Because yeah. they were going to kill this gangster, this murderer. Big Pussy was a gangster, a murderer, a drug dealer, and a snitch, and the audience loved him. That was from your performance. I killed yes. Elvis. You remember? I killed Elvis, and they still liked me. So, so Vinny, when you find out and you finish the season, it was very sad. I mean, I was on the show by then. The cast was really sad. Uh I mean, that had to be really, I, I, I mean, I, it had to be really sad. The show went on and it kept on going on for, you know, five more seasons. You were, of course, a part of it and our friends and we did appearances, but that had to be a tough pill to swallow. I know yeah. it would have been for me. It would have been for me. No, no, it was, it was hard. It was hard for me to, uh, I was even like, the, the, when the third season started to air, I, I wasn't even I, I wasn't even watching it for a while. I tell you the truth, no, you well, know, I, I was I was devastated that this show became a huge hit, and financially and career wise, I wasn't a part of it. But also on the positive note, I was the first soprano to be, with the exception of Rispoli to be uh, available for projects, and I was, I was grabbing them. Yeah. Uh, and I went to Hollywood, and I knocked up a bunch of movies in L.A., and uh, it was so cool. So my life really, really changed because of this show, man. You know? yeah. I'll, I'll never forget, I was driving down Sunset Boulevard once. You know, if Sunset Boulevard, they have these huge billboards for, for movies, for TV shows, advertisements. And there was a huge, one of the biggest, it was, it was vertical billboards I've ever seen of you in a black jogging suit. Sean John, it was yeah. puffy. And it said, Vincent Pastor, actor extraordinaire. And I was just like, whoa. Well, I, I mean, it was well, like 10 stories high. Yeah. Uh, Pete Diddy did that. We did Made Together. Um, John Favreau. You know, what, what was that episode? Uh, that was what, D Girl. We did that uh, right. last and week. John, John asked me right on the spot that day, uh, "Can you drive a limo?" I said, "Yeah, I do it part time." He says, "I got something for you," and that would, and we did me, you know. So what happened is I met P Diddy on May. He was with uh, Jennifer. She was his a vocal coach. That's, what's her name? Jennifer what? Lopez. -Lo. Yeah, she was seeing him. So. Um, uh, we did this photo op and I didn't make a lot of money. And I remember Abram said to me, well, you got to get more money. I said, it's Pete Diddy. Come on. You don't bang this guy out. And he puts my picture up on our wall. Guy Richie's driving down Sunset Boulevard, sees that, calls up my agent. The next thing I do, I'm going to London to work with him on Revolver. So that's what happens. The, yeah, and no. was he, was he married to Madonna then? Yes, he was. Cause when I went up to Sunset Boulevard to the house, I was doing the practice out there with uh, Michael Bataluka. And, and when I went up to uh, the house, she was there. And she says, uh, I know you know Debbie, because she's good friends with Debbie Mazar. Right, yeah, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. Forever, yeah. 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 And then when, uh, when the premiere came out in London, um, she fell off the horse and had a sling. And I had a heart attack. She said, how's your heart? I said, how do you know about my heart? She said, Debbie told me. So she was she was close with Debbie Mazur, uh, Madge, Madge. I call her Madge. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you go on, The Sopranos is over. And I remember you also did a, uh, you did a pilot. I, I don't, did you do Emerald's pilot? No. Yeah. Oh, you, did, you did a yes, pilot with Emerald? And yeah. Then you, he, was, you, uh, he was terrible. What, a terrible what, was he acting in the pilot or was it a he a couldn't movie? remember his lines he yeah, couldn't remember his lines he had his cue cards he kept saying bam 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 <laughs> but he couldn't remember his line he always <laughs> says bam well, but what, it, what 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 show is, is it, this is it bam or bar man but i can't, can't get the, uh, what no, show i is don't it? know he had a he was shooting a pilot he was he as an a, actor or as or yeah, as, as a an 
It was him, and I was his guest star. Sitcom. And I said, I said to him, don't you know how to act? <laughs> and he had a series on NBC, Emerald. Yeah. And he's how long guy. was it on he's for? A, he's a good guy, good guy. No, how yeah, long? he's a good, no, he's a good guy. How long was the show on for? A couple of months, I don't know. Yeah, it didn't last long. It was a half-hour sitcom, Sherry Shepard, and it was, I think it was called Emerald. That's when, you know, Emerald at one point, he was the Food Network, and with the band, yeah, he was a hot guy. He happens to be a very sweet guy. His restaurant yeah. in New Orleans is great. Yeah. Really sweet good. Guy. Yeah. But, but, but Vinny, you did, you started working a whole lot. So we were doing the series. You come back for a guest spot here and there. I'm sure people are saying, hey, you're gone, you're gone. Like I said, tough pill to swallow. But you got a SAG Award. I got a SAG Award with you guys. It's in the, my living room. I adore it. Uh, actually, now I'm on the SEG national board and local board in New York. So you got there. It is Michael. There it is. I have it one. Is. I have one in New York. Yeah, yeah that was that was uh, insane. You got to uh, say a nice thing with your for your mother. Yeah, yeah. It was a great night. Your it was a great night. Um, and and me and Jimmy and Sirico went up on stage and we presented best comedy that night. Um, it was really, it was really great. Uh, I really loved it. And uh, I remember walking down the red carpet at one of the premieres. I think it was the second season because we went over to Spago's later. And I'm walking with uh, Michael. I'm walking with uh, Ozzy Davis and Ruby D. And Ruby also D from Mount Vernon. From the yeah, no, the Rochelle because Ozzy's kid Abdul Wali was playing in my club at the time. I think they lived in Mount Vernon. At well, some point, maybe both. A, and then they moved them back up the police station near the show. But I'm walking with uh, Ozzy and Ruby, and uh, it just was like, and Guy Davis was in, and it was like, wow, this is surrealistic, you know? Because Guy used to sing at my club, and Ozzy and Ruby used to come in and watch him. It's like full, it was like full circle. Guy that Davis, was, a blues blues guitarist, right? He's a blues guitar now. Yeah, he's a good actor, too. He was in Beat Street when he was young, you know? He's an actor? Yeah. Let me ask well, you this question. If acting didn't happen, because you didn't really, it, it kind of came your way. You didn't pursue it. Someone recommended you, right? Well, I was doing community theater. Oh, you are? Uh, okay, I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, I was doing community theater. I would come home from work and go change and go to Holy Family, go to Bless Sackman, Nurse Show, and do plays. But if acting didn't come your way, what was like your plan in life? Probably just to stay in the club business. Club business, yeah. Yeah, I'd probably be dead by now. <laughs> it's a rough business, yeah. Yeah, cool. that's a tough oh. one. It's, it's a lot of fun. Vampire oh. hours. It's a lot of fun, but it's rough. So, Vin, then you work with Louis Lombardi, who you know since he's a kid. He's older than you, and he becomes the FBI agent, Skip yeah. Lombardi, and you're working with him. That's full circle, too, no? Yeah, well, Louis used to come in with this guy, Tony Rome. And Tony Rome was a wise guy from Pelham Bay. Can I tell these stories? You don't care. Yeah. Ah, what do you mean? And, 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 he was, and Louis was his bag man. And Louis was coming into my club, Michael, 13 years old, working with Tony Rome, going to Peach Trees, Lollipop, uh, uh, second floor, and collecting, you know. And then they used to come over later and sit at the bar and drink. So that's when I knew Louis. He was like 13. 13 years old, and then yeah. next thing you know, you guys are in a cop uh, doing a scene on the hottest show on TV. That's pretty amazing. But yeah, it was really good. It was good casting because oh, I call him Ducky. Uh, he used to come over to the house here on City Island because uh, his family lived over in Pelham Bay, and we work on the stuff. Then I pick him up in the morning, we go out to the set, boom, 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 and we come home. We we loved it, man. Yeah, he told we us, were, we had him on a few weeks ago, and he- Oh, you did? He said well, great things about you, great things about oh, you. Oh, see, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we had him on. He, he's very funny and a good guy. And, uh, uh, besides The Sopranos, what is your favorite thing, if you could pick out one, that you've done since? <laughs> probably, uh, not probably, definitely Bullets Over Broadway. Uh, Woody Allen's play. That was great. I saw it. I saw yeah. it. With Nick Cadero, with Nikki, the late Nikki. We lost Nikki during oh, this COVID-19. Um, it was wonderful. Wonderful experience. Oof. And you also you know. did Chicago? Yeah, I did Chicago with Aida. And I, I got that. my I got my equity card. But, but Bullets Over Broadway 
I created a character on Broadway, Michael. It was mine. Nobody right. did it before. I mean, Joe right. Bertarelli did it in the movie, but I did the play. Right. And then when the play goes on, I went and did, uh, I did it again on the Gonk with Maine with Sally Struthers. And it says in the playbook that it's my name. So that's, that's, that's beautiful. That's real. Uh, well, in Chicago, you came in later as a replacement. Chicago, uh, what they do is, um, you should do it, Stephen. You should play Amos, <laughs> the cellophane man. They always bring in like a guest every three months. They, it was great. I, I saw you on Broadway. Did, did you hit on Sally Struthers? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I did. I knew what, gonna do up at, what are you going to do in Maine when, you know, the whole community is, is a gay community? Uh, actually, uh, there was a Monday night and they asked me to host, uh, what do you call those shows when the guys dress up like a woman? Drag show. Drag, drag show? Yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of community up there. So I did hit on Sally. She was getting upset because I wasn't, um, she was hitting on me. Okay. All right. And she was getting upset because I didn't bite, you know. That's a good drag name, Big Pussy. If you're oh, a drag yeah. queen, that would be a good yeah. name. <laughs> yeah. Well, we went there for rehearsal in the afternoon, and this guy came up to me and says, you know, tonight I want to say your name, Big Pussy. I said, I don't mind. So then the show was packed, and I'm standing there, and I'm watching Liza Minnelli standing next to me. And he says, hi, Vinny. <laughs> and it was the same guy. Great. I don't know if you want these stories on your. This is great, of course. We could tell whatever you could tell whatever you want. Pretty, oh, we're, yes. we're having lunch. It's the three of us. What are we doing? Listen, so it comes time for you. They're gonna kill you. They're gonna kill you on the boat. Give me the whole layout. Where, what, what boat? Where was it? What was in the studio? Tell the fans out there because they're very curious, as I am. Well, first. They shot the scene of me walking up the gangplank with Sirico, Silvio, and Jimmy. And Getting get on the boat. boat. Then they cut to Silver Cup, and they built a boat in there. And we were in there all week and shooting the interior. And if you pay attention, the interior of that boat looked a little bigger than what that boat should have looked like inside. <laughs> but, and they, but it was rocking. How did that was, happen? Yeah, because you had the crew rocking it. So okay. it was not on the floor. It was like raised on something. Yeah, it was like Noah's Ark and they were rocking it. Wow, because yeah. you see it. That's why I was confused because I know you did it in the studio. And when I watched it last night, I'm like, wait a second. That's going back and forth yeah, like it's on the yeah. water. And we were there for a while. And then we went out to Jones Beach to shoot the scene uh, of me sitting up on the boat going down below and the scene when they gave, brought the body bag out and they threw it in and they couldn't make that bag sink. They were shooting all day to make that bag sink and it wasn't going down. Were you in the body bag? Uh, some <laughs> people think I was and some people think I wasn't. It depends so the, how you... The, the crew was shaking the set? Yeah. That You know what that's called? Poor man's process in film terms. When, when you do like... Like when you're in a vehicle or some kind of thing and the people are pushing it rather than it yeah. really happening when they're yeah. shaking stuff. That's called poor man's process for some reason. Poor man's process? That's a tough right. film term, yeah. So, Vinny, this took it, so it took like uh, quite a while, a few weeks to shoot this scene, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, actually, uh, it was more days on that episode that season uh, than any other episode. They added like four or five more days. They really wanted to get it right. You know, the scene is, I mean, the episode before, the whole thing where you think you're an FBI guy is just hilarious. Yeah, I was chasing I, down I, Michael. It's just fantastic. Yeah. You hit the guy and, you, you know, you're using all the FBI terms. I mean, lingo. Really, really is funny. Uh, <laughs> you know, the thing that gets me, your wife, paid by, played by Tony Kellum, I mean, she's has no idea that these two guys might have, you know, you come over the house, they come and get you to go look at a boat. You never come back. And it doesn't cross her mind that maybe they killed you. Oh, maybe she, it does. She knows she doesn't she want to. That's why she was blackmailing about the car and everything. Right. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. Well, that comes later on. Yeah. But she, yeah, she uh, knows. 
I want to ask you this in this episode, in in this final episode, right? When you're at Vesuvio with uh, Tony Soprano and Paulie Wall, and you're talking about the phone scam, and Tony Soprano looks at you, and in that moment, he knows you're the rat for sure. Why is that? Just his gut. Just his, uh, it just dawned you, on him. That's, that's a choice you would have to ask Jimmy if he were around. I don't know why it was then. It's interesting, well, uh, though. Was it in the script that way? Or was uh, it's, way that's what I'm asking. It? It's interesting. I don't know. I, I'm Probably. Gonna, I'm going to say well, I think so because you knew Big Pussy knew it so well. It was almost like you were reciting this thing. You're giving, yeah. uh, you're giving Furio every single detail. It's like... It's one thing to say, yeah, we do this and this, and we grab a lot of money off it. But you were, like, reporting, you know? Because I was wearing a wire. Exactly. And so you were almost repeating it. Uh, Did you really eat the Indian food in the last episode? Chicken vindaloo. No, Johnny V ate that food. (laughs) No, he was mad because we... I, I don't remember. What did we do? We went for uh, uh, Indian food, and yeah. that's what got us sick. I didn't get sick. Jimmy well, nobody sick. knows, oh. really, because you didn't get sick. He, he thinks it might have been the muscles, but you ate the muscles and didn't get sick. I have a theory about that, that he wasn't really sick. He didn't have food poisoning. It's the knowledge that pussy's the rat that became the sickness. Uh-huh. You had said uh, pussy had a slight case of diarrhea. He tells uh, you, you on the phone, uh, Big Pussy told, tells Tony. Artie Bucco. Oh, yeah. Artie Bucco. Oh, Artie Bucco, yes. You know, tells Artie Bucco that he had a slight case of diarrhea. Uh, you called Uncle Pussy every day of your life. Right? Uncle Pussy? No. Uh, Big Pussy every day of your life, correct? Uh, if I leave my house, but nobody's, especially in the pandemic, there ain't nobody call me big pussy in this house lately. What about your granddaughter? What does she call you, Grandpa Pussy? No. <laughs> <laughs> she calls me Grandpa. But there are funny stories with me and her. Like when I take her to the National Zoo and yeah. people jerks they yell at hey pussy and she's looking at me and i say hey looking for the pussy cats you know uh, <laughs> one time we were in baltimore having dinner in uh, the italian section and some lady i don't know she, she looked i don't know she kept saying hey pussy this and i finally had to get up and i went over i said my granddaughter's here will you relax you know because uh, the, the kids don't get it you know i mean she's starting i don't think she gets it now she gets shark tail that's her favorite movie michael you know a lot of kids you love know, that movie, yeah. They love Shark Tale. But uh, both Vinny but, and I um, are in there. She has been able to watch Sopranos yet, so I don't think she knows why they, they call me Big Pussy. But they do. Uh, you know, when we did the stage show, you tell a really touching story about Jim. Do you want to share that with our audience? Well, Jimmy was, was probably and will probably be the best actor I ever worked opposite with. And I'm not just saying that because we're on the show. It's just the compassion that he had. And uh, I didn't have the training that Jimmy had. And he guided me. He helped me with my scenes. We would go in the trail. I'm sure he did that with you guys. Ran the lines. Uh, if I wasn't comfortable, I remember that scene. He came over and I was sitting in a chair and my back was hurting. I said, I'm eating juju bees like they're going out of style. He kept asking... Uh, you want another take, you want another take. And he was so given. Um, when the nominees came out that morning of the second season, um, my phone rang at 7.30 and it was Jimmy. And he said to me, you got robbed because I didn't get nominated. And he really wanted me to get nominated. And for the I Emmys. Said, yeah, for the Emmys. Yes, Michael. And you should have. You should have been nominated. You should have, of course. Well, I don't know what the politics what that was about. Maybe because I didn't have a name. Maybe it was my first job. I don't know. I don't. I really don't know. There's a body but, of work involved with some of them, I believe. Yeah. They yeah, were a little yeah. slow to slow to acknowledge the Sopranos. Let's. They were. On. They yeah. come on. We know. We went yeah. through hell. Yeah. They didn't want. Yeah. We were up against. We were up against that West Wing. Constantly. West Wing in the practice. Yeah, and the practice. Yeah. Right. David Kelly. Right. But he said to you, you got, uh, he was the first one to call you and he said you got robbed. He so, said I got robbed. Yeah. So that and, was, uh, he was thinking of you that morning. 
Yeah, Jimmy wanted me yeah, to that's get the kind nominated. Of guy he, was. he wanted me to get nominated. Yeah, he would, I would run lines with him a lot, too. He was a big help to me because I also was probably greener than you, uh, but uh, Jim was a big help and comforting, as was Dominic. And you've done a lot of work with Dominic. I studied with Dominic for a while. Dominic, really? I ran into, yeah, I ran into Dominic um, in, the, in, in West Bank one night. We were watching, I think, a Philip Carlo play. And Dominic was talking to me and I said, Dominic, you should teach acting. So I got Tony Rossi and a few of us and we put a class together and it ran for about five weeks. And uh, I worked on a view from the bridge with Dominic. So Dominic Before was, Sopranos or after? Oh yeah. No, before Sopranos. Before. And he taught, the, he, taught the, he taught the class, Dominic? Yeah, it was his class. We put it together. I, wow. You know, I got the idea from doing that stuff with Tommy. So we had uh, Tony Cucci, Tony Rossi. Uh, we were all studying with Dominic for, for a while. He was wonderful. To Tony Rossi, who was in the college episode, that Tony Rossi who played Febby uh, Petrano. Was that something like yeah, that? Yeah. yeah Tony, he did a great yeah, job in the college. Very good, yeah. He was great in that yeah. episode. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dominic is, uh, as you know, the sweetest guy. Now, you teach, and you enjoy teaching a lot at HB Studios in New York City. Uh, do you see some young talent? Some people got it, some people don't, some getting better. What's that what's that process like? Like, you know, you you see these kids come in and younger people, older people? A, a lot of people just want to take the class with me because they wanna hook up with a soprano. Okay. Then they come in, then they come in and they realize this ain't that ball game. This ain't no meet and greet fan club. You got to go to work. And some of these guys, they don't know what they're doing while other people come in and use usually students that have already studied at the school. They know what they're doing and they take off. And I've had some students that studied with me nine, 10 workshops and really, really became good actors. And then there's some people where I say, don't even bother wasting your time. And I tell them not to come back. I got to tell really? them. You know, what are you going to say? But you, know? but, you, but you tell them because they're not putting the work in. You say this isn't for I'm you. Tell, because they, you know, it's like there was a guy who drove a bus and he'd come in and he wasn't prepared. And I says, you got to either be an actor or a bus driver. You can't be both. And that's my theory. I, I packed in my life to become an actor. I drove cabs, limousines, did whatever I could to supplement my income until things started to work out why well, I didn't have to do that anymore. And, and um, I really feel that you either going to do it one way or another way, but you can't say I'll do it. You know, 50% of my life, I'll be an actor. The other 50% I'll go work in the bank. It ain't going to work out. You're going to wind up being a community theater actor all your life and you're never going to make it. And that's what I you got to go guys. all in. You got to go. You got to put, yes. Yeah, like, come on, Michael, look how much you put into your life in this. Yeah. Same thing with you, Steven. You know, we put our life and soul into this, and that's why we're at this level. You can't say, oh, I'm going to do this, and then once in a while I'll go do an acting job. This is, it. you know, you know. And some people want to put the work in, and then some people, it's a hobby or whatever, you know. And like you said, they, do you make them call you Big uh, Mr. Pussy? No, they call me Vincent. And do they raise people, their hand, Mr. Pussy, Mr. Pussy? <laughs> no, and some people, some people, because they're so good fellows, because they're sort of sopranos, they think they can act. Yeah. Because they're Italian. You yeah. know what I'm trying to say. Well, I, I said that uh, early on, early on in the podcast, after the Sopranos, every fat, sweaty Italian guy wanted they to be wanted, an actor. Right? That's right. And they still do. And they still do, you know? I mean, come on. <laughs> so they say, hey, Vinny, yo, how can I get a job? I say, go study. Yeah. Go study. They don't like to hear that. No, nobody likes to hear that. Go study. Go read a play. Go do a play. Go do a play. And they think that you just, it just happened for you. They, oh, yeah. gonna give I, your agent. I look like him. I act like him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So you got, uh, before we go, you got your pasta sauce. Uncle Pussy's pasta sauce? Actually, uh, they ran out of it. Okay, but but you're in business. Listen, I yeah, well, I tried. We were, I went out of business. I tried it. It wasn't good. I hope you have more success than we well, do. Well, I'm I'm the opposite because of the pandemic. You can't find the sauce nowhere. So they got uh, more sauce coming in next week. But right. people went and bought it because of the pandemic. They What's were it called? Out with cases. 
It's called Steve Sharippa's pasta sauce. No, it's Fitty Vap Fitty Pasta sauce. Fitty Pasta is Italian marinara sauce. Is it good? Michael, you want to know the truth? Yeah. I never sampled it and I approved it. And then one night I cooked it at home and I said, This is good. And I hope some people like it. Thank God. But, but I but I wouldn't I wouldn't make that because it's got all the vegetables in it. Whatever you do, don't sell <laughs> Uncle Pussy's fettuccine sauce. That that won't work. <laughs> Alfredo Big sauce. Pussies. Yeah. Big, Big pussies. pussies. Putanesca sauce. Putanesca. Put, put uh, so, uh, but, the, but the sauce is coming back. It's fun. Good. It's uh, a little like income on the side. Good. Let me ask you about this. You have your own podcast. What's the name of that? Forget about it. No, no. I, I, want, you, I want to promote it. Tell us the name so we can tell the audience they could tune in. What's the name? Forget about it. Steven, Why don't you want to tell us? Guy? Tell Forget us the name. Forget about it is the name... <laughs> <laughs> all forget right it's called forget, forget about, about it. it how does right. the audience find it where can they tune in <laughs> like the sauce it's not available yet it's not available okay. when it when it no, is available we're taping we it we're taping it and it's going to want stoic uh we're taping it up at united nations stations on madison and it's going to go over after labor day and uh, you'll find it where the podcast yeah, 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 a lot. They're gonna promote it, but it's a variety show. Like, um, well, it's I'm based in it, and I told Stephen when he was on uh, that I'm stealing everything from the Wise Guy show. It's the same format. Now With tell tell of, everybody what that was. Well, I have an original song. No, what was the Wise Guy show? The Wise Guy show was on Sirius uh, Satellite, produced by Little Stephen, and we had Cha Cha, uh, Joe Regano, Vinnie Vella. I was Gordy. a guest host. Remember. Me you too. And I went away. Yeah, yeah. You guys me used to take over from me. So a variety yeah. show, like what? Like Ed Sullivan? I could spin plates. I'll come on yeah. and spin plates. How's yeah. that? I got somebody coming on for Halloween uh, who, who tells you, like, she sees ghosts. You did that stuff, Michael, with ghosts and stuff. Celebrity right? ghost story, yeah. Yeah, yeah for yeah. Halloween, I'm doing it. I was so I, I, You know, I'm, and I'm going to tell you something, guys. I respect it. I love you. You guys are my brothers. I, uh, I'm trying not to put too many Sopranos on because I think this is the Soprano show to watch. I mean, you're not going to get any better education about the Sopranos from you guys. And I want to do more variety and there's a little studio in there and I'm going to have guys like Willie Nile up. I'm going to ask your son to come. I love Willie Nile. He's a friend yeah, and he's see, a tremendous musician. That, and it's going to be, I'm, I'm trying to do more like a podcast, but more like Jimmy Kimmel with musicians and stuff like that. Well, and you love music. You love, yeah, music. love music. Love it. My love son it. Uh, David played with Vinny and his band in Asbury Park at the Wonder Bar last year for the Veterans Day benefit. My youngest it's son great. played guitar with Vinny and uh, Eddie Testa band and uh, Killer Joe, the Gangster Squad. Uh, we had a great time over there in Asbury Park. Yeah, that was great. That was great. That was the Wonder Bar. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's, it's sad now. I mean, there's no music down there now. The only thing they do is uh, they do outside the you know, with the dogs and stuff, and they serve drinks, but no music down in Asbury. It's well, really let, sad. Let, let's, let's, hope, let's hope we get through this and uh, it gets better. Well, and, uh, we are getting through it. We have to learn to live a different lifestyle. You know. Well, listen, you be safe. I love you. Thanks, Thank for, you for, thanks for coming on, man. Was, Thank you. Great talking this was, to you. This was a lot of fun, guys, and good luck with your uh, show. Yeah. And may your first son be a masculine son. And hopefully we'll be hopefully flying to uh, Europe in the spring, huh? I hope so. Enjoy your yeah. head. You look good. They look good on you. All right, brother. Oh, you don't know. I'll see you. See you later. I love you guys. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thank love you, you man. Vinny Pastor. Now, that, it doesn't get better than that. That's, that's great. That's a great, great interview. Vinny's a good guy. We had such a good time in Australia. Great actor. Great in this episode. And listen, just to remind you, we've got a lot of great guests coming up. We got Catherine Narducci, who played Charmaine Bucco. She's wonderful. Janice Soprano, uh, played by Ida Totoro. We've got Jason Sabone, Jackie April Jr. We got Peter Bogdanovich, who played uh, Elliot uh, Kufferberg and a wonderful director. Steve Buscemi is going to be joining us this season. Uh, writers Robin Green and Mitchell Burgess. Annabella Sciorra is going to be joining us and a whole bunch of other cast and crew. So 
Whether you listen or watch, stay with us, man. We got good stuff coming. Steve Buscemi is going to come on to break down the one of the greatest ever Soprano episodes. Maybe one of the greatest TV episodes ever. Pine Barrens, which is in season three, and Steve directed that, and he's going to join us for that episode. It's going to be a very special one. I can't wait for that one. Yeah. All right, so uh, before we get started into this episode, we haven't done it for a while, but I want to do the finale uh, the wingo meter time. This is the last time uh, we saw Tony Sirico. Those were the wings. Can you see them? Yeah. You get a good look. Those There's are Tony. pretty big. Those are big wings, big wings. And now, for the first time ever in the history of Talking Sopranos, it was in the shop. It's out. It's you got thick. it? The wing o meter, my friends. Oh, there it is. Not the wing o meter, but the wing o meter. It's there digital, it is. isn't it? That's it's, amazing. It's four different shots of the great Paulie Walnuts. All right. Okay. That's the wing o meter. If you are listening, you want to go to YouTube, you want to see this. You want to I, you know, you- I started to doubt it was a real thing. You know, you right. had me at first. I believed it. Then I didn't believe it because I never saw it. You always said it was in the shop. It wasn't in the shop. And now here we are. Here we are. Which hey, uh, which company makes it? Is it Apple? Is- <laughs> Who makes it? Tangerine. Steve, Steve Jobs. Wasn't he was working on it. And he then, was working on uh, it before he passed away. Before, I think so. Yeah. So here's number one. There's the number one, if you could see it. That's uh, a, a, a certain kind of wing. Number two, a heavy wing. Heavy wing, number two. Uh, number three, hang on, hang on. Let me get this right. Uh, number three, here is number three. Here's a different poly, different expression. Wow. It's yeah, a heavy a, wing. That's a lot of wing. And here is... The ultimate wing. Uh, That's almost like more wing than not. This is a lot of wing. That we're, I, fl- we're flying off to Rio on that wing. Speaking of Rio, please give credit to the artist Rodrigo from Brazil, who cre- act- is the actual real creator of the wingometer. Our fan Rodrigo from Brazil. And here you go, Tony Sirico. Number two, Paulie Walnuts. It was a number two in this episode. The finale, he had a number two wing. We saw the other wing. That was uh, the the, the wing uh, weeks ago, episodes ago, and now he's a number two wing. So So let me ask you, does the the wingometer interfaces with the episode and it gets like a logarithm and then figures out the wingometer? It's very complex, isn't it? There you go. There you go. And I've been telling you about this since we started. We're on episode 26. I've been telling you about the wingometer, not a wingometer. It's not wingometer. You're sure about that? You saw it yourself. All right. Everyone saw it. If you're listening, tune into YouTube. You want to see this. It is the first time ever that it has anyone has seen it besides myself and my family. Mm. Thanks All for right? sharing that. There you go. The finale of season two, for me, it flew by the entire season. For Michael, it was a little slower, but... Nevertheless, a lot slower actually, but no, but no less of an enjoyable experience. Okay, great. I'm enjoying great, every great, minute of it. Great, great, great episode. This uh, may be um, my favorite uh, episode of the season. I think it's uh, it's incredible. Um, you know, David. This is written by David Chase and Todd Kessler, and David said in an interview he didn't want uh, like a procedural element to this episode when Tony finally is certain Tony has to decide pussy's a rat and he's got to find out right he didn't want some procedural cop show type thing where the feds tell him it's 100 percent or a cop tells him or another mobster and he said and David said because this is a show about psychology psych you know you know psychiatry psychology 
It's a psychological show more than anything. So he came up with the idea of Tony really gets it from his subconscious, his unconscious, his gut, his in, it's, it's, it's a intuition, Tony's intuition. He felt that was way more interesting than just like make it like plot driven. And then that came the idea of this fun house, that this whole thing is about the subconscious and this dreams and its hallucinations. And they really went all in with that idea of the fun house. And I think a lot of this was influenced because David is a big fan of Fellini, particularly eight and a half. And there's a lot of that. Surreal. He had a, a picture of Fellini or, uh, in his office during the oh, yeah. House. And um, I think... David and John Patterson, who directed this, really went for that vibe in this episode and really pulled it off. I, and John, John Patterson has to get a lot of credit for his filmmaking in this. The camera work, we'll go into detail in specific scenes, but I, I love this. I love this episode. Uh, you know, Todd Kessler, who was with us for a while, but a, a good guy. He uh, created Damages and some other shows. Uh, he's had a lot of success. I remember Bloodlines. Him as Do you well. remember him coming to Vegas with us? To give him his it, brother. And he came on some of our the To the Nugget when we when we no, did the Nugget? Uh, uh, I think uh the Valley's Bal 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 And he was uh, involved in some of our the uh, botchery. And he's a quiet, very uh very nice behaved guy. And big uh, talent, that's for sure. Uh, that's for sure. And this was a great, great episode. So we so we open up, we're at Livia's house. Tony, Livia, and his sister, Barbara. Uh, this is Nancy Marchand's final performance, this episode. You know, she was in that episode later, and it was they had to manipulate it digitally to get her. But this is her last episode, really, officially, as an and, actor. Uh, do you know uh, Janice, who I don't believe is in this episode, but uh, episode 12, of course, she was gone. After episode 12, after she shot Richie April, she got on that bus to Seattle and was not supposed to come back. As and an actor or as, as a an character? Actor, as a character and an actor. She was gone. Uh, we will talk to Aida when, when it gets on the show, when she comes on the show soon. But, uh, yeah, she was gone. She was off the show. And then with Nancy passing away and... Uh, Aida, Janice came back to the fold. So. so they needed that strong kind of female antagonist yeah. for Tony. And Fam we, familial and, one, yeah. And she filled those shoes one. Oh, two. God, yeah. So uh, Tony doesn't want eggplant. Uh, this is the first time, uh, the only the second time he sees his mother, right? He saw her in episode 12 for the first time all right. season, and now he sees her here. She does, doesn't want eggplant. She's complaining, blaming Carmella. Uh, well, which, he says, she says, Carmela wouldn't take me. Uh, Barbara's not going to take her because Barbara's husband, Tom, doesn't want Livia in the house. Green Grove doesn't want Livia because she was abusive to the staff. She says, Carmela doesn't want her, but that's not true. Right? She's Carmella asked invited numerous her. times. She's asked numerous times to move in with them. Uh, Barbara is very good in this. She's playing it so real. Nicole Burdett, is so, it, we so spoke real. about. She's a playwright and screenwriter. And, but very, uh, and, just and very actor. understated, you know, at the table. Yeah. A terrible situation. She doesn't know that, uh, that she conspired to kill Tony. She does no. not know that. She does not know that. An interesting casting, if you think about it, because like Aida... Aida and Jim are like, you could see, cut from the same cloth. And Aida psychologically has Livia's traits and stuff like that. And, you know, Barbara's a very different person. A def very, she's the youngest, I'm assuming. Uh, but somehow it makes sense in a weird way. Like, families are like that. You know yeah. what I mean? There's, you could have two that is very similar and one that's younger, that's a little different or that has different temperament. But somehow it makes sense to me. I don't know. And, and, and she's very good, very understated. Sorry, you can't live with us. And he is, Tony Soprano is just pissed off. She's got no gratitude. He's yelling. He is livid. I mean, he is livid. This is a tough situation. Yelling, and he's always yelling, but he's yelling differently. This is his mother. His sister's there. He gives it, goes to the car, gets the two plane tickets that are hidden 
go to Tucson with that other Miserab, and Quinn throws the tickets basically at her. And the other aunt lives in Tucson, Aunt Gemma. Aunt Quinn lives in Jersey, I'm assuming. That's her sister, Olivia's sister. That's her sister, and it throws the tickets at them. Uh, the next scene, uh, we see a man making a phone call. Uh, another guy comes up to him. He says, listen, they go for $20. I could sell you this for 7 bucks." So there's a scam going on with the calling cards, you know, which were very popular back then. I don't know if they still are. Are they? I don't think so because now everyone's on cell uh, phones, cell phones, smartphones, and it's yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they don't. No one uses a payphone anymore. Exactly, you can barely find one. Indian restaurant. Tony Pussy and Sundeep are at the table. Sundeep hands Tony an envelope uh, with money. A lot Tony, of money. Happy, a big yeah. thick envelope. Uh, they toast. The three of them toast. You see the statue. Of uh, I don't know what that's an Indian statue with the six arms. I don't know if that's uh, Shiva or maybe uh, Kali. I'm not sure. It's somebody like that. Yeah. Uh, so the restaurant a lot going on. They here they come. Tony's in a great mood. And the song uh, that starts here through and through, which is a, it's a Rolling Stones, but it's a Keith Richards tune uh, off the Voodoo Lounge album. And Keith Keith loved the fact that we used his song. He's very proud of it. He loves well, he that was, song. He was at the season three premiere. He was at the premiere. When I showed up at Soundcheck in Toronto at their concert, oh. he played it, which it wasn't on the set list, and he played it because I was there, which was kind of amazing. But he's, oh. I, you know, it's a great, I mean, Keith, I think, is a very underrated songwriter. Well, I mean, a lot of his Stones tunes, like TNA, Little TNA, I mean, Happy. His songs are really good when he sings uh, and when he, he writes the lyrics and stuff. This is a great tune, and it just works for this episode. It's in, it, it's in the episode twice. Yeah. Do you think that he doesn't get the do that he should because of the whole, you know, he's whacked out, that people think he's whacked out and, and, and he's had drug problems and he's all over he the He gets back. plenty of do. I mean, he's, he yeah. gets a lot of respect. I mean, he's written yeah. some of the greatest songs of all time, and he's, you I, know. I've, I've met him a few times. I don't know if he knows me exactly. He about. knows you. He knows the show. He's a brilliant guy, a really smart dude, man. Knows a lot about a lot of things. And, uh, yeah, he's, man, I mean, it's Keith Richards. He's a legend. It's, so but before we, so when we go from the, uh, we go from the phone booth and this guy trying to sell the phone card, a view of the bridge before we hit into the Vesuvio, right? This is back to the bridge there. Back to the bridge, we're in the Vesuvio. Tony and Pussy arrive, Furio and Silvio are eating. Tony spins Adriana around, he's happy. Uh, he gives uh, Silvio a stack of cash. I mean, he's ecstatic here. Uh, he's very happy. Uh, we haven't seen him this happy in a long time, right? In a long time. Uh, Pussy, uh, they just finished eating. You know, Richie's and, gone. Janice is gone. That's probably so, one reason. His, uh, his daughter's graduating. He's got a new scam. Bunch of money. Uh, Silvio's happy about that. Furio asks, what's this thing they're talking about? You know, it's just the first week, Tony tells Silvio. Uh, in vivid detail, Big Pussy explains the credit card scam, uh, this phone card scam. And he does, and Tony's watching him, and it's and Tony just something does not go down right. And my, like I said in, in the interview with Vinny, my take is it's not food poisoning, it's not E. coli, it's this whatever this germ of betrayal. That's what gets him sick, and it takes that sickness and those dreams and hallucinations for him to know 100% in his gut and his con subconscious and now conscious mind that pussy is a rat, and then it's confirmed later on, for real. But right here, when Tony gives him that look, it's not the first time Big Pussy has said this. That's what I'm saying. Not the first time Big Pussy has acted kind of... No, but has... Furio says, what's going on? He explains it in vivid detail right. about the, the scam. He has said this before, probably to Skip Lapari and the FBI. This is not the first time that he's explained this. That's why it just rolls out of his mouth. 
because he's explained this to them already. That's how Tony gives him that look. Yeah, and and it's enough for him to start, you know, really thinking something's just off. Now they're eating. Uh, they ordered uh, uh, Silvio's having zucchini flowers, which is one of my favorite things. I'm sure you love them. They and they stuffed, stuffed it with, he ricotta. says, dry regat, dry regat or ricotta salad. That's a nice cheese. I mean, yeah. uh, that's really my gra- good. My grandmother used to make them. My grandmother made uh, homemade macaroni every Sunday. She made that and she cooked for, in, a, in a neighborhood of Italian Americans and, and first generation Italians. She was known as a great cook in my neighborhood in Bensonhurst. And she actually cooked for a store. It was called Emilio Brothers. It was a grocery store in the back. They built in this catering thing, and she would cook, and they had frozen eggplant, you know, way before its time. I'm going back to the 60s. You know, you could buy eggplant. You could buy the sauce in a jar. You could buy all that stuff. And uh, when she would make these uh, zucchini flowers, if you get a chance, not many restaurants have them. They're seasonal. Uh, usually, yeah. Uh, but what what did she stuff them with? Regatta, regatta, regatta yeah. you know, and whatever else she put in the regatta, and they're just incredible. And yeah. I, there's a couple of restaurants have them here and there, and they're just incredible. Not, they, Look, Italian care. food, in many ways, it's very simple. Usually, there's not a lot of ingredients, but if you don't do it right, it's awful. Italian food, uh, you have to have good ingredients. Number one. It's usually very simple, but if it's not done right, it's you can't fake it. Is what I'm saying. Like you, know? you said, it's, it's very simple. They, and then uh, Big Pussy, after eating this huge meal at the Indian restaurant, he or they order zucchini flowers and uh, zuppa the mussels. After the mussels. Indian meal, like an hour later or something, right? I mean, and the the mussels in the red sauce and. Probably dip the bread in the whole shebang. You know that. Uh, Tony, uh, uh, Patsy comes in, played by Dan Grimaldi, with a soup egg. Uh, it, it, Tony chases him. Get out of here. He don't want anybody to chases see Chases him. Get out of here. He shakes his head. He goes. Tony comes on with the soup egg. He's joking around. He's very playful. Carmela's busy taking care of gifts with the high school. She's very involved, and he uh, pulls out a big, beautiful... Well, first coat. he, like, says it's a uh, a merkin. You know what a merkin, merkin is? Yeah, like a toupee for uh, a woman's... Uh, exactly. ...vagina. Is that uh, correct? Yeah, it See, is. See, I cleaned that up. What else did he say it is? He said it's a... a he's opening it up. He goes, oh, my God, somebody put a... Uh, my, my, my suit is growing a beard. Growing a beard, or is it a merkin? Merkin. Uh, and someone else uh, wrote, uh, this is Tony being the caveman, bringing the skinned animal to the, the, the alpha male, bringing the skinned animal to the mate. Who wrote that? I saw it somewhere. Okay. No? I, I, I don't like that at all. <laughs> he brought his wife home a fur coat that he bought hot, from Patsy Parisi. You don't happy. like that at all. You're I don't like talking. it at all. He's happy. <laughs> this is a good moment. He's with friends. Just made a big score. No enemies. Janice is gone. I mean. Things are good, right? It's like one of those good. moments where you can relax and just say, you know what? Maybe life isn't so bad. His oldest daughter is graduating from high school. She got into great colleges. That's tomorrow or, or in a couple of days. Brings home this beautiful fur coat. She sees it. She's over the moon, of course. She's all in Carmella when it comes to... Uh, and last episode, they had a lot of problems. This will change the problems, okay? Oh, uh, we, I missed one little detail. When they talk about colleges at Vesuvio and, and Artie Bucco says, Holy Cross and Johnny V. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very funny. <laughs> that was a Johnny V thing for sure. Also, uh, you know, he they have sex. She wears the fur coat. She comes out with nothing on but the fur coat. And uh, you see them have sex. She's very. Have you ever worn a fur coat for sex? I have not. I have no. Nor have I wore a merkin. No, I haven't either. So those are two things. They used to be in. I mean, they used to be a thing, like in like Elizabethan Shakespearean times. I think. I don't think it's it's not a big thing anymore. 
Well, uh, you know, I've seen it on TV. Uh, where? Yeah, where a woman is, you know, on, on a show, whatever. I mean, what on, show? On uh, vinyl. On vinyl. The actress in vinyl was completely nude, and she was wearing a merkin. Oh, because it, it was the seventies. Seventies piece. So either she grew it out, or it was a merkin. But I come to think, it's a merkin. Oh, you're not sure though. I didn't ask her. I mean, I, I, Andy, can you find out what uh, if she was wearing a merkin? So uh, I thanks. two things I've got on my bucket list: a fur <laughs> coat and a merkin. Okay, I'm anti fur. Right. I don't like to kill animals. I'm anti fur. I'm a, I'm anti fur. I, I'm not. A, my wife. I like, like faux fur. If I brought my wife home a fur coat, she wouldn't even take it. Right. Same with me. Yeah. Uh, Asbury Park Boardwalk. There's snow on the boardwalk. You got Silvio. Pussy, Philly Parisi, Paulie, Chris, Hesh is on the, ca on the bench. Tony walks up. Now, do you think setting it at Asbury Park, is it, you know, uh, the good old days? It represents, the, you know, the time when things were, things were innocent, things were happy, things were fun. It's also by the ocean, which is where he's going to end up. There's foreshadowing, like foreshadowing, like he's having a uh, premonition of what's going to happen. What do you think? Well, by then, uh, Asbury Park 20 years ago was pretty banged up, as you can see. It was. It's much nicer now. We, we it's perform, great now. It's fantastic. We performed there, uh, I don't know, six months ago or something. It's wonderful. Right? Yeah. And, and then, then we had, Vinny had the show with my son David in November there at the Wonder Bar. It's great. Wonder yeah. Bar's great. Tremendous place for live music. You know, and so we saw the boardwalk, which is not like that at all. It's actually very nice and very, uh, I, I want to say maybe it was in uh, right before the pandemic, uh, I believe yes. we were there. And, and so it's a different time. It's kind of beat up. It's banged up. Back then, not uh, now. Yeah. Back then. This was, uh, this was shot in 1999, 2000. All right. So, I mean, it's a great location for this. I think it's really takes on a whole, it, the dream takes on this whole significance. And, you know, that's what I'm saying. It's like at the time it was beat up and it passed its prime. So it's almost like that's what he's feeling. Like things are all, you know, are not like what they used to be. I, I'm not quite sure because he was just in a good mood. So I, I, I don't know. I'm, but that know, doesn't last. That good mood goes very yeah. quickly. In this you, know, these, uh, you know, the dream sequences are always a little confusing to me, I'll be honest. I mean, I love them, but they're a little confusing, the meaning of it. And, these, and there's a lot of them in this episode, and they're deep. A lot. Have, Have you ever had deep. food poisoning? Uh, knock on wood, no. Never? No. Now you're going to jinx, jinx me. I'm not, I'm, that's not my plan or my intention. I've had food poisoning. So now I'm going to get food poisoning. I know I am. What? I mean, why would you think that? I mean, what, do I have magical powers that can go through the podcast and give you food? I mean, that's basically what you're saying, is that I'm some kind of sorcerer who can influence your digestive system through what I say. You're, you're, like, you're <laughs> like that statue with the eight arms. <laughs> I had it once. It's terrible. When I lived with Johnny on the uh, Lower East Side, I got it once. Really? And he was home with you? He was. Oh, he took care oh, of me. He nursed me back to health. He made me soup. He made me uh, consomme and soup uh, okay. and stuff. Believe it or not, he did. Uh, he took care of me. That's very funny. Uh, yeah. So Tony's got until uh, Tony tells the guys he's got until September fifth to live. He's got cancer. Uh, the family doesn't know. Pussy's just staring out at the ocean. He doesn't say anything. Hesh is talking about medical protocols and procedures. He always knows. Hesh <laughs> knows best. Uh, Tony lights himself on fire. Christopher says, what if the doctors are wrong? Right after he lights himself on fire. Uh, Philly asks, there's nothing they can do for you. And it's shot really cool. Whatever yeah. lenses and, and the composition and the way they're moving the camera and, and even lighting it and staging it, it's really great. Tony wakes up at the Soprano house. It's all a big nothing. Who says that all the time? That's Olivia, Olivia. line. Uh, uh, you know, life. It's all a big nut in life. That's your mother talking. Sit up. It's not my head, it's my stomach. Runs to the bathroom. He's crying. He's in pain. Everything's black. I mean, Jim does an incredible job here. Uh, he rushes to the bathroom. He's screaming, that's the Indian food. Uh, metal, that, that's racist. 
you know what? I'm going to say this. I'll be a hundred. This is, has nothing to do with any, you know, saying wh why or whatever. That's how I got it. In, I got it from an Indian restaurant on, you know, really? in, in Manhattan on sixth street, there's a bunch of them. And I ordered lamb. I used to, I was eating meat at the time and I got food poisoning, but the spices are supposed to kill it, but it didn't in that case. You know, uh, I've never really eaten Indian food. Oh, I love it. No, I've I never. I, I don't even know if I've ever had it. Curry, is it. curry. I don't even know. I, I love curry and tandoori and all that stuff. But I did get uh, food poisoning. Well, my wife enough. says let's go out to dinner. Indian food never comes up. So we're gonna have Chinese. We're gonna have Japanese. We're gonna have sushi. We're gonna have Italian. You know, that right. that's it just doesn't. I'm I'm not and not for any reason except for I'm not familiar with it. But I don't think he gets food poisoning from Indian food. I don't think it's food poisoning. I'm telling you, I think it's some kind of, okay. it's like what I'm trying to do to you mentally. It's not really real. It's You're my own. You're gaslighting me since we started this. You've been gaslighting me. It's my own power of, you know. <laughs> You're making me think I'm losing my mind. Uh, he, we got to take a break here. Should we, are wait, wait, we done wait, wait, with I got this one scene? more thought. One Go more ahead. Thought. Uh, she says, there better, she says to AJ, there better be Coke in there or else. Coca-Cola. That's an old Italian or old remedy. Coca-Cola, you sip on that. Warm stomach, Coke, though, like, or flat Coke. No? Your stomach feels better. I don't even know if that works. But. Food poisoning is awful. I mean, you feel like you're going to die. It's really, you know, it's, it's horrendous. I mean, and it's not, it, it, it lasts for a long time. Like, you have it for a few hours, and when you have it, you feel like you're dying. It's bad. Well, I hope I never get it. I hope you. Skip's car. Pussy uh, jumps in the car. How to go? He hands over tapes and money. Skip gives Pussy $200 back. Uh, I love when he says, you know, I had a guy, uh, uh, you know, confidential informant who flipped, uh, did his time, and then he wound up being a garbage commissioner in Florida. <laughs> and Pussy's considering that. It just doesn't. Appeal to uh, pussy, I don't think. And not in a bad city. After new identity, a snitch can do pretty good. But, but let me ask you this. He asked for Sundeep. Is Sundeep a snitch? Or he just knows he's involved? I think the Fed set up this whole operation. Okay, there you go. Or somehow he, let, let it happen or, you know, pushed it along was, as a way to get, as a way to entrap the Soprano family. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, he's saying it's sun deep there. Also, he says, I know Tony's your friend and here you go. Big Pussy says, President Franklin is my friend. It's right. all about money. But, but Franklin was never president. We know that, right? Just like Alexander Hamilton. He wasn't either. We found that out the hard way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, President but, but Franklin, all, you know, no. All about money. He's saying, I don't care about that. I care about money, which we all know that is what drives the mob is money. And they make a point of showing that in this episode, especially at the end. And, and, and that's, you know, it's a, there's a food chain kind of thing. You know, that's another metaphor that we're talking about food and getting sick off it or whatever. And it, it's, it's very evident here that that's part of it. We got the soprano, soprano bedroom. Tony comes out of the bathroom. He's drinking the Coke. You still like your coat? I love the Coke. He, I love the Coke. Uh, he's sweating. Jim's doing a great job here. I believe every moment of this. And 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 Edie's really good in the, the both of them in this episode. All their scenes. Yeah. You know, Jim. Uh, Jim is actually tremendous in this episode. Um, yeah. You know, all the scenes. I really was like. He's in this show so much in this series, you know, scene after scene after scene, and he's pretty much always there. It's kind of incredible. I mean, there's some heavy stuff in here. He looks terrible, you know. The physicality of it, yeah. Oh, this looks terrible that throughout the episode. I mean, he's got the bathrobe, his, his big face into the screen. I mean, it's, you know, he says he ate too much. He, I think he mixed the food, the Italian, the, I know your theory, but he had the Italian food, the Indian food. He says the goddess statue with uh, six arms, no wonder. Blames the Indian food, but not the Italian food. But then he does blame the Italian food yes, later. But for now, he's just blaming the but Indian But to get food poisoning, you have to 
consume a bacteria, which is, you know, is in this case, they think, you know, sometimes a salmonella, I think is a different thing. That's often an uncooked chicken or uh, trichinosis and uncooked pork and this uh, E. coli, which sometimes they get it in vegetable lettuce and something, something like that. That's but bad. you have to, con it can't, it's not just indigestion. Something's not sitting right. It's actually, it's a, it's a invasive bacteria. There's not much they could do. I think it's got to run its course. There's not much you can do, yeah, no. Yeah. Asbury Park, we're back to the boardwalk. Tony uh, walks along the boardwalk. That's a famous, that has become him smiling. What is it called? A gif? 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 Gif. G-I-F? Gif, That's yeah. a famous gif now on a lot of things is it? throughout the internet. Famous. Throughout the internet, you'll see him walking down the boardwalk. He's got a big smile on his face. Uh, it was Silvio's voice, uh, I believe, right? He's uh, it's a, a really cool shot there. He's smiling. Uh, Silvio says, our true enemy has not as yet to reveal himself. Obviously, that's... Well, that's point. a line from... And he's dressed like Michael Corleone, Godfather 3. He's dressed in that outfit, the sweater yes. and the, glass, the glasses on the chain. Uh, one of a couple of Godfather references, sleep with the fishes, that kind of thing. That and obviously he's world. talking about pussy. Uh, Tony puts a quarter in the boardwalk binoculars. He looks, he sees himself and Paulie playing cards. Uh, he shoots Paulie, cuts the black. Paulie gives us the <laughs> Well, it's also that noise. You know, when the when we're looking through those kind of paid binoculars and it, it becomes almost like a little, uh, yeah. you know, the movie real, show. Yeah. And then it clicks like it's shut off, which, and that's the cut. It's really cool. Really good. Uh, is that where they're sitting? Is that where the theater is? That's not the Paramount Theater, right? There's so I much think that's the, is that the old uh, train station? I'm or not quite sure. Convention Center or something like that. You know, that whole... This is before a lot of that was rehabilitated. And yeah. Stuff. yeah, 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 yeah. No, in in Asbury Park. So Melfi's office. Uh, I had fucked up dreams last night. You never dealt with your anger. It cuts away. It's Annalisa uh, from Italy with an American accent. Uh, yeah, and it's all this mother stuff. You, you're going to make me eat. <clears throat> She's going to say maybe, you know, or whatever. And Annalisa is a, is a matriarch. In Italy, she's a powerful woman. She's a powerful mother. We saw Melfi turn into Livia at some point, you know, and there's it's a lot of this mother figure. But I loved how he's talking about Paulie Walnuts. He says, there's a guy, he annoys me. He sends out typed reports about his family at Christmas time, which I it's a very revealing thing about Paulie. You don't, wouldn't expect it about his nieces, nephews getting into West Point, a hole in one, and he hums commercials. Do you really think, I don't think he's talking, I, I think we assume we're talking about pussy, but. Paulie. I mean, about Paulie, but. Yeah. I don't, you really think Paulie Walnut sits down and types Christmas newsletters? I think he does. He doesn't have kids. He doesn't have a wife. He, that's his, his <laughs> way of, <laughs> yeah. Well, what's the, what's the jingle? Uh, uh, what do you think? What commercials does he have? Uh, good, you know, I don't know. McDonald's? McDonald's? Probably McDonald's. Uh, Soprano House, Tony runs back to the bathroom. I think you have food poisoning. He's got chills. He's got gas. Bad dreams. Tony is in bad shape. Bad shape. This is a severe bout if it is yeah. food poisoning. Uh, and it's building up. I mean, to me, the, why I was saying this thing about it's his unconscious recognizing pussies are right. You see it in the last when they kill pussy. This is a huge deal imagine having to kill your best friend you know it's like it's like if you know we had to take uh if we had to take andy and bring him down and get rid of him because andy was working with the feds and betraying us we know? may have to do that that would be very very, andy. very hard we got to shoot him in the boat we got to you know andy. i mean not think about that that's a really hard thing you, it you wouldn't know. bother me that much no, I'm joking. Well, you're a cold-hearted guy, Steve. What can I say? Uh, a Fiat. It's a little clown car. Uh, Tony gets in. Adriana's driving. Christopher Furio in the back. Uh, where's Pussy? Where is he? Uh, a Furio hands him a roll of toilet paper. It's a that's I, you know it's a simple little 
nothing seen that's really, <laughs> it really made me laugh. And weird as hell. Yeah. The car is weird. The fact they're not looking at each other. I'm in the back with Furio. You know, <laughs> it's just friggin' weird. Now, this next scene is just a hilarious scene. Johnny, Johnny Fentimiglia, Artie Bucco comes in, rings the bell. He wants to finalize the menu. Carmella forgot all about it. Uh, he yells for Artie to come upstairs. He, Tony's blaming the muscles. Now and, he's convinced it's the muscles. And Artie takes great offense at this. He examines every piece of shellfish, he said, personally, which probably he, is not true. He is very, very uh, uh, taken aback. He's got an A rating, he said. That's all he cares about, that it wasn't at his restaurant. Could care less about Tony. Fuck Tony. It wasn't at my restaurant. Uh, said they had Indian food. He says that's, uh, 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 what's it, uh, clarified butter? Ghee is clarified butter, and they use it in a lot of food. And then he mentions that uh, he watched Indira Gandhi's funeral, and they put that on the body. I actually, when I was in Cal uh, Calcutta in India, along the Ganges, there's these, they call them the ghats. They're, they're like where you go to do cremation, and they're outdoor. And uh, I went, and this family invited me in to, to watch uh, only men were allowed at the time. I don't know if that's changed. And the guy was in a shroud and they burned him. And you watched it? I did, yeah. The family invited me. I was curious. They saw me. They said, you can come. Why would you want to see that? Uh, it was, I've never seen anything like that. You know, I, I don't think I ever will. It was. I don't want know. to see that. Well, you go to you go to other. I mean, I go to other countries to experience different cultures. That's that's how they do it there. You better. They actually were. Me. They actually were videotaping. It's one of oh. the family members. Oh. I'll be honest. But, and then they take the ashes, and then and when it's done, they put it in the Ganges, which is a sacred river. But, um, you know, that's how they that's how they uh, wow. have funerals there. Yeah, it was very intense. I'd never seen anything like it, and uh, wow. and the the people there were very. You know, welcoming. They, you know, they, they, um, you know, they have a bit of a different perspective on on life and on death. I think, yeah. you know, uh, but um, it was wow. fascinating. You're a better man than me. I, I don't know about that. I don't want to see that. Uh, so Artie calls pussy since he ate with them, and he's saying uh, Tony's a little green around, a uh, little green around the gills. He's playing it down to pussy, Artie. On the phone, like, you know, he doesn't say how sick he's Tony deathly ill. <laughs> really <laughs> is. Uh, he wants to make yeah. sure it didn't come from Vesuvio. Uh, he says he just had a touch of diarrhea. Uh, Artie just kind of blows that off. Uh, Artie says, I feel vindicated. Tony is a complete mess. But all Artie cares about, it's a bad thing to mention if, if his restaurant. If he has food poisoning that came from his restaurant. It's, it's a, a very funny scene. John Ventimia is great in it. Livia and, and Ann Quinn about to get on the plane. Security arrives. Stop by Ray Garvey, our old friend, the late Ray our, Garvey. Our, our dear friend who I love dearly, who was a, a comic and actor. Uh, he's done a bunch of Woody Allen movies. He owned Pip's Comedy Club in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. He owned the Borgata Comedy Club. I used to help him there. Uh, he also ran with Sirico. He was Sirico's right-hand man for a while. For a while. Sirico always had a right-hand man. A guy. A guy that would drive him and be with him and go to events and just look out for him. And there was Big Mike Scooch and then Mike Sullivan and, 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 and Ray was... And Ray Garvey, uh, yeah. he got sick. May he rest in peace. Uh, I really was a dear, dear friend of mine and... Uh, I remember taking him, he came to Foxwoods with Sirico and he was, we were eating, uh, I think Steve Martirano used to cook for us. So these At great meatballs yeah. from Martirano. Great Cafe Martirano in Fort Lauderdale. And he makes uh, crab with a red sauce, which you don't get very often. It, when I was young, I can't eat crab anymore. I'm allergic, but when I was young, my father would make it. Uh, it was linguine with crab sauce. Out of this world, Ray was so drunk, he fell asleep, boom, his face right in the dish of crab. 
grab sauce, and they had to help him. He was so big, so strong, a legitimate Brooklyn tough guy with a beautiful heart. Big, they, big heart. I remember and Jim, speaking of that food, Steve Martirano, one of the best chefs around. And if you're in Fort Lauderdale or even Vegas, you have to go yeah, to that yeah. to Cafe Martirano. It's some of the best food you'll have. Well, once in a lifetime eat. meal you'll have. Yeah, but Ray was doubt. our a uh, dear, dear friend. He plays a uh, security guard here. He was good friends with Woody Allen. He did a bunch of Woody Allen movies. So they get the team, Livia and uh, Aunt Quinn. The Melfi's office. Tony uh, goes into the office, has a T-shirt on with a giant heart on. So obviously uh, he's, t- uh, he's taking Blue Chew because only uh, Blue Chew could do that for you. He was probably taking a <laughs> prototype. I don't know if it was on the market then, but something like that. You know, what's weird during this scene is there's weird sound effects that sound like they're on a boat. Again, foreshadowing the premonitions of what's to come on the boat. There's like creaking. It sounds like he's on some ship. It's very weird throughout this scene. Uh, They must have laughed their ass off when they shot this scene. You know that. Jim and Lorraine and with him with the boner and the pant, the tent. What do they call that? Pants tent. They must have laughed their <laughs> ass off. I'm sure of it. Uh, you know, when you, when you say pussy, do you mean my friend pussy or pussy pussy? Uh, I got pussy on the brain. I want to fuck you. He clears the desk out and he jumps on uh, Melfi and they have sex on the desk in his dream. Is that the only time they had sex in the show? I know he's wanted to. He tried one other time, but I'm not quite sure it's the only time. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, he, So he had sex with Carmella in this episode and Melfi. And Tony Melfi. Soprano. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Cusimano, now, is this a dream or not? Uh, I don't I think, think so. I'm not sure. I think they did have Dr. Cusimano come on. I don't think that's a dream. No, he's there. And apparently Jim had ice. They had the, he had the crew make him like an ice bath with ice and cold water that he would go put his feet in or do something, his head. So and just because be he wanted it. And uh, he, he says he's, it was E. coli. You know, he's saying it's E. coli bacteria. He can't go to the hospital because they're not going to do anything. He does hum. He starts singing the Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's theme. Island's theme song. Again, the boat. Three-hour tour. The castaways are going on a boat, foreshadowing yeah. of where we're going. Uh, Cusimano is a pompous asshole. I know doctors like him. He's a pompous asshole. Why do you say that? Because you, you can see in this scene, he's says there. It all. He goes he, over he, to his neighbor to check on him to help. He doesn't. Him. He doesn't like Tony. He wants nothing to do no, with Tony. No, that's not true. Listen to me. He uh, he could have not went out at all. He could have stayed says, home. He knows he has to. He can't turn them down. You'll be fine. He's condescending. He's not comforting. He's not saying like a doctor should. Hey, don't worry. 24 hours. Give it time. He Absolutely said, oh, you're going to be not. fine, Tony. Don't worry. What, are you, what is he supposed to do? No. No good. No good. Man, I wouldn't want to have you as my patient. Okay. That's all fine. <laughs> well, what, what do I got to do to please you as a doctor? Be comforting. Bedside manner. You want to really give me strong... some assurance. Give me assurance. I don't know. Okay. It seems like he said, "I, I you're going to be fine." Listen, I'm sure he's a very nice guy. Uh, Who? What's his name? Cusimano? Yeah. What's his name? Uh, he's uh... Bobby Lapone. We're not talking about Bobby Lapone. We're talking about Cusimano. Oh, I'm saying Bobby Lapone plays a great role because I'm, I'm. I assume he's a terrific guy, but he's playing a fucking asshole. <laughs> Dr. Kuzumano. <laughs> I, right. I don't really agree. I don't know. All right. Listen, we agree to disagree. We agree to disagree. That's true. Uh, fish store, uh, you also like to go see people get burned. I don't like to do that. I didn't say I liked it. I said it was interesting. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I wouldn't click like on it on like Instagram or something. I was there for the, you know, just the experience. It's not like or dislike. It's just. Heavy we're like duty. we're like Siskel and Ebert. They didn't get along either. Who says we're not getting along? What? Where? Where is this coming from? You're very sensitive. I mean, it's fish store. I gotta uh, watch everything I say here. Uh, fish. Uh, fish store. Now, does this? Uh, why is is Pussy? Is, now, listen, uh, Pussy. Uh, the fish sleep with the fishes. In the pilot, he talks about Luca Brasi. Correct. 
We're talking about the Godfather. There's a fish. Um, the fish says, you passed me over on promotion. And the fish talks about pound, uh, $4 a pound. It mentioned something about flopping around at the bottom of the sea, which is where he, what's going to kind of what happens at the end. He's going to be flopping around at the bottom of the sea. Um, it's kind of hilarious. It's, it's absolutely hilarious. Uh, you could almost see Vinny in the fish. <laughs> I, I did that animatronics maybe. Uh, where they? They, yeah. I, I, where they, you know, they get the mouth because the mouth doesn't, it wasn't just going up and down, you know, no, it was animated. Damn good. CGI. Uh, it said he lost weight. He says swimming, it's the best exercise. <laughs> it's absolutely hilarious. And he says he got passed over, Silvio, if you remember, and Paulie. And he talked to Paulie in Luke Costello Park. Uh, uh, when Furio Pussy, came. Pussy, answered, Pussy and Furio answered to them. He got passed over. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Was that part of it? Uh, it absolutely me. was part of it because that's when the suspicion started. Yeah. He asked him, how much did you give him? He said a lot. And uh, it's a great scene. It's very funny. I yeah. wonder if any, I, I, I meant to ask Vinny if he's got one of them fish. He should have kept one of those. Kept one, yeah, that's a good I, I would imagine, right? A soprano house. Tony's getting up. He's getting dressed. A Carmella brings consomme. Uh, doesn't want him to go. Well, she wants. You better be okay for the graduation. But now he won't. But it's not. He didn't after the dinner, right? At Vesuvio, when he heard Vinny blabbing, he didn't that night call Sylvia and go, "We gotta, we gotta whack him. We know he's the rat." It took this hallucination and this yeah. dream and this illness. Now he's sure. His subconscious has proved it to his conscious mind, right? Uh, he, uh, you know, so he said uh, they arrive at Pussy's house. Uh, Pussy he runs, says, hop along Kessadish. You know what Kessadish means, right? No. What do you say? Yeah, but well, I've heard hop, the that hop along Kessadish. Kessadish means what do you say? Hop along Cassidy was a, a movie cowboy or TV cowboy or something. Uh, Tony and, and Silvio arrive. They, you know, they, they, uh, he hears them come in downstairs and they're upstairs. Out, they don't let him leave the bedroom. If you notice, they don't let him leave the bedroom. No, they let him and they, they ambush him almost. They run up them stairs quickly. He can't get out. Tony's got to run to the bathroom. They go he downstairs. He can't hide the ev any evidence. Yeah. Uh, Tony looks bad. He's still and pussy sick. knows what's going on, I think. He's starting to get it for yeah. sure. You know, uh, he tells his wife, my poor ass. Tony and Sylvia, they meet at the bedroom door. They kind of ambush him. Tony uh, talks about the boat. Small talk. I mean, it's a big red flag. I mean, they're coming there. Tony looks terrible. They got Sylvia. They're going to go talk about a boat now. Come on. Pussy's been a gangster for a long time. Something. I agree. Up here, I know? agree. Uh, he doesn't have much of a choice, though, right? No, and he finds the tape. He's looking around. He finds the tape in the humidor, and he's now this is sealed for sure. He already knew, but this but really the, seals it. this weird little dream sequence that comes here yeah. when so he's not asleep at that point, right? Well, he falls asleep in the back of the car. They're driving to. That's the what it is. Okay, he falls so he asleep falls in the car. Falls asleep in the is. car. Uh, Silvio gives him a uh, has a flask. Gives pussy a drink. Tony falls asleep for a second, and he says, I bought a beautiful boat. He's in a great mood. They all clap. Uh, uh, Meadow's going to Columbia. I liked uh, in the car, Stephen Van Zandt, it's a very different attitude. You know, he's not tipping it off, but he's also not hiding it. You know, when he takes out the flask, like just it's, you know, you never see Sylvia drink in the day. Like, you know, there's... It's yeah. business, it's hard, it's personal, and it's, uh, it's a big deal. And it's w very well played, the tension here. Um, he says sea legs, like, like drinking is going to help you get sea legs, yeah. which also means you're going to go take the boat out for a spin. The other thing is when they get there and S Paulie's there, Paulie's attitude is totally, you see that's, there's no nonsense. And when he, when he, he kind of guides, put, come on, puss, he guides him. There's like, 
Paulie is like really the, the stand up gangster. Like you need something done. That's the guy. He's the go to. And he's, it makes sense that he would never flip or something like he's just, he has no family. He's not worried about his kids. He doesn't yeah. have that. This is his life and that's it. And you uh, see it in that moment there. I'm sure Tony made the quick call to Silvio. Silvio probably told Paulie, meet us out at the boat. Told him what was going to happen. Though. Oh yeah. And, and Paulie's very, it's, it's business. It's all you know? business. Listen, I've said this in the other episodes. These guys joke and they play and Silvio does the, uh, the impression of Al Pacino and, and it's all fun and games and the bada bings and they break balls. Uh, Sars and Schultz. When it comes to business, make no doubt about it. They are flat out gangster killers. The yeah. three of them. And you see it here. The attitude when they're leading him on a boat and then when they go downstairs, it's just... It's very different. They it's are selfish. They are killers. They uh, uh, they sit pussy down. Uh, they uh, the great Sinatra song. It's a great right before they go downstairs on the boat. You see, Tony puts his hand on Paulie's shoulder. Just a little detail, and you just see like. We got to do this. You know, it's just a tiny detail, but it says so much. It's just like, we're in it together. We got to do this. It's going to be hard. Let's go and do what we got to do. You know, it's a big deal. They're going to kill him. He knows it. Uh, why Why did you? Make, why are you making me do this, you fat piece of shit? Uh, when, they, when did they flip you? Don't lie. He denies it at first. Then he comes clean a year and a half. Uh, Paulie, Silvio, they're livid. Just livid. Paulie pushes him. Uh, Says he's been feeding them disinformation. He's been mind fucking yeah. these donkeys. Uh, he told them about the calling cards. What's Paulie say right away? I'm not in that. What else? That's all Paulie gives a fuck about. Did you tell on me? Right. Right? I'm not in that. What else? That's a Silvio thing, right? Uh, but Tony doesn't believe a word he's saying no, at this point. No, you know? but he's, you know, he denies it. Then he says misinformation. This is a great thing to do. This is how you get them, give them false information. You know, he's working them. What about Wabistics? He told them, yes, Paulie's giving them the dead stare. You know, he asked for some good, could, said, you have any good tequila? And he gets Corvo, which Paulie is. Paulie gives him a great death stare. Paulie is chilling there. Yeah. yeah. No emotion. I mean, it's, he's really great. Yeah. You know, uh, they give him a Corvo. Uh, they all do shots, pussy. So pussy had a drink on his way there. He had a couple shots there, you know. He, he brings up the girl in the acupuncturist in Puerto Rico, something he, he would eat her out, which, you know, because Junior – took a lot of shit for going down on a woman, right? Yeah. Now you're saying that this guy does it. Is it something like another example of not being a stand-up wise guy? Good point. A little Very bit? Possible. I don't Good know. Uh, the great shot, he wants to sit down. He's feeling unsteady. Then uh, Tony sits down, and they push in on both of them on singles and they push in on Tony and they push in on pussy. It's great. The way they shot it, edited it, uh, the way he built the tension, John Patterson in this. Scene. Oh, it's great. It's Tremendous. great. And, 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 uh, you know, you feel, you feel bad for pussy. You know, what's coming. There's a lot of tension. Uh, they don't want to do it. They're, they're childhood friends. Uh, you know, pussy's a little older, but, Childhood friends, you could see they don't want to do it. They have no choice but to do it. They don't torture him. No, he says, not in the face. Let me keep my eyes. That way they can have an open coffin. If they find him. If they find him. Uh, so he asked for that. They give him that. Uh, then they they feel why they take Why they take the jewelry? I thought that was very strange. Uh, I thought personally... For the watch, which is probably an expensive watch, why did he take it? One, because maybe they won't be able to identify him. You know, by the time they find him, 
the weights, you know, right away after they kill him, get the weights, they throw the body overboard, that he'll never be found. If he is found, they could identify him through the jewelry, his wife, his family. You don't think oh. they're going to eventually give it to the family? No. 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 I thought, if anything, uh, Paulie might sell it, but would you incriminate yourself? The DNA. Ba, 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 That's ba. what I mean. Yeah, you're going to sell pussies, Julie. Uh, you know, it's like I, I, the only interesting. Thing I, the only thing is, uh, he doesn't want to be identified at all. I, I would say, yeah. but once again, does greed come in and he says, "Hey, I could get money for this necklace. I could get ten grand for that watch. I don't know. Money, money, money. Greed. You know, uh, soprano living room." Uh, Tony's watching. The oh, tip. after they throw him overboard, John does this thing, right? They get finally get the body. It's kind of in a wide shot. They struggle. They get it overboard. But then he does three singles on Tony, on Paulie, and on, on Silvio. And it's, they're, they're beautiful shots. I don't know why the composition, the way, the angle, the way he shot it, it's just really effective. And, you know, it wouldn't have been enough just to do it in the wide and the body goes overboard. Those three singles afterwards really just tells the story. It's, it's a, it's you know, a lesson in filmmaking, you know? And, and, and for a split second, they feel bad, you know, and then right away, get the weights, throw them overboard. I thought I saw a, a, a Sirico double uh, on the edge of that boat, which it probably was. Oh, really? Maybe. I think so. I'm not positive. Well, there was one when he shoots him in the dream sequence. That was a double. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean he wasn't gonna but I think I think when they threw that over they were on the ledge of that boat, you know, and uh yeah. right before the singles. When they uh, shot him that they used the ratchet. You know what the ratchet is? No. When they shot him, he's in the chair and he goes flying back. They at, literally have a harness and like a and like a rope or cable and they tie it to a machine like that really quickly pulls you. It's a, it's a mechan you know, this mechanical device that like, whoosh, and that pulls that thing and jerks you, you know, jerks you back really hard. Very dangerous. The stuntmen uh -huh. know how to do it and take it, but that's how you get that blowback. Really, it's not. He's not propelling himself. There's a machine, and they 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 find a way to hide it, either with the shot or sometimes CGI and stuff like that. Wow. You know what was always funny? You know, we all had stunt doubles. So in the makeup trailer, you have these styrofoam heads with the wigs. So the doubles could look like you, right? So right. they, but seeing your hair there, my hair, but seeing Paulie's hair and the wings, right? it's incredible. <laughs> But I, I, I don't think the wing meter would work on the double. I think it's only tuned to actually to Paulie's you're algorithm. Pro I you're think. probably right, but so. it was very funny. And then there was that stunt double he had, and the, he was running around with the, you with know, the, the wings. wig with the wings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really funny, you know? Yeah. He looks like somebody it from Star funny. Trek. Tony's watching The Temptations, one of my favorite groups of all time. Uh and if you have not seen uh, Not Too Proud to Beg on Broadway, when things get back, go and see that. Is it good? I didn't see it, yeah. Not not good. Great. It's absolutely great. It's based on a book by uh, the founder of The Temptation, Otis Williams, and it's absolutely great. Phone rings. It's Livia. Don't call here. Uh, she said, we've been here since 9 o'clock. I'm at Newark Airport. You see uh, she's still in the security office. And uh, she basically gives Tony up. Tony gave Anthony gave. She us, thinks he did it on purpose. Well, he says he did later. He knew and, they were stolen. Yeah, she he thinks did. she's setting him up. Uh, it's kind of like Pussy fucked them beyond the grave in a way because Pussy gave told them about it. That's right. But I loved Edie's line. <laughs> the fun never stops. <laughs> there's something very funny about that. You know, it's like it, and it's true. It's like there's always the drama it's just gone, keeps going. It doesn't. Uh... Uh, the FBI rings the doorbell. You got the great Frank Pellegrino. Uh, He's Frank really good in this episode, Frank Pellegrino. His, act, his acting is very subtle and really real. He's. Very Frank, real. he was a, was a tremendous actor and, and I, very I, I, honest actor. Uh, believable I, I, as hell. I believe every second of it. Every second, Absolutely. yeah. 
And here's a guy that was not uh, an FBI guy at all, a really good entertainer, owner of Rails and a dear friend. Uh, we have a warrant to search your house. Tony's still a mess, still not right. Uh, what, what, you know, what, what are you looking for today? Stolen airline tickets. We found them in your suburban. Uh, also, before this, Carmela says, don't forget to pick up the gift at Comp World. You know, oh, the yeah. computer world. And he says, if you would have let me get the one with the smaller cre- screen, we could have gotten it for nothing. A hot right. computer he was going to give to his daughter for her graduation. The Columbia University, yeah. And she said, don't snap at me. Don't press your luck with this diarrhea. <laughs> and uh, uh, Frank comes in. The FBI comes in. Tony, of course, isn't very nice to them. Uh, open the door. Here comes Meadow and her friend. She runs upstairs. She's horrified. Her husband, uh, father's coming out in cuffs. She's there with all her friends. I'm graduating tomorrow. Uh, and Carmela says to the FBI, can't you wait to persecute him? My, our daughter's graduating tomorrow. All right. She says, I'll call Mink. I don't trust the secretary. Yeah. <laughs> and the feeling, the idea that they're persecuting, I mean, I don't know. So, you know, I guess that's what they have to believe, you know. Uh, Tony, FBI, uh, FBI headquarters. Tony's weak in the knees. They're fingerprinting him. He's still sick. What's the matter? You can't stand the heat. Last episode, he sent Frank a deli tray. Now he says, no more deli trays for you. Be careful. You know, the little detail after he gets fingerprinted and they're escorting Tony to the cage, he flips the tissue that he's wiping his hand right at the that other Fed agent. It's just a, probably Jim just threw that in, but just a great little, little detail. Great things, uh, which separates the Sopranos from most shows. Yeah, and Look. then you cut to uh, Joan Baez playing in Meadows' room, Diamond and Rust. And this is a great little scene here between the two of them, because uh, between Meadow and Carmela. Because um, Meadow's really, you know, she's like hard here. You know, you she's see- She's her father's daughter right here. She's her father's daughter. Right here. She will cut them off. My friends don't judge me. Fuck them. If they do, I'll cut them off. That's it. Carmela, great wife here. Great mother, saying that your father cares for us, for you. Everything he does, he does for us. Ba, ba, ba. Good scene. Mink's office. Always the comforting father. Cusimano should take bedside matter from Mink. How's that? Mink is good, yeah. Uh, Mink's getting paid a lot more money than Cusimano is. Mink, Mink <laughs> makes me feel good. What did he pay? I asked Junior for last episode, $400,000. No, it wasn't him. That was. Oh, that was the other lawyer. Richard well, Mink's Obama. getting probably a similar amount of money from Tony. Maybe he is. Uh, uh, he say, you know, I love Tony's blaming Livia. That voice, that voice, you know, she just, he had, he, he gave it to her to shut her up and he's, you he know. Said, he says, I, 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 right, doesn't he tell him? I knew they were bad tickets. I knew I was giving her a bad ticket. Uh, one more minute, if I stood there, you know, uh, I beat the homicide. Now I fucked up. I blew this one. I blew everything. Federal charges, thirty to life. But he didn't expect her to get arrested. He just no, no. To set I don't think away. he set her up. He no, did. she thinks he set her up. Livia yeah. thinks he did. Yes. Uh, Mink says they got nothing. He still get on with your life. I got nothing. He's very comforting. Very comforting. You're right. All right. He should be Dr. Neil Mink. All right. Uh, the courthouse, Tony and Mink, they walk out. He gets into a limo. Why would he get into a limo? They do that. Lawyers uh, often have limos, you know, when we, uh, you know. I'm just saying. You know, a lot yeah. of lawyers do that. Yeah. Uh, Melfi's office. My mother, uh, you would think she was never married to Johnny Soprano. She, you know, because what she said on the phone, right? Uh, 
He you know, does... Melfi really nails him with this denial because he keeps going back trying to do, you know, uh, he's Olivia, he's giving her the thing with Junior. You know, it's good for business, but he also kind of, you could see he has a soft spot in a way. These are two people who tried to kill him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he does Olivia imitation. Poor <laughs> me. Right? He does. That's the second one. Yeah. Right? There's yeah. Olivia imitation. She, Melfi tells him, your father, for a tough guy, this, that, he didn't protect you from her. Uh, then he tells her he had, a, uh, he had sex with her in a dream. You loved it, she said. You loved it. You really <laughs> loved it. Uh, she says he's got a lot of sorrow, and she also admits that she's afraid of him. Yeah, she tells him for the first time that. Uh, yeah, and then he and goes out singing. Buddy Holly song. He says, fuck you to her. He says, fuck you. He also, and I think they cut it off. I kind of remember him saying, maybe, baby, I'll have you. Maybe, baby, I'll have you. And then he said, and I think they cut it. Maybe, baby, I'll eat you for lunch. Oh. You remember that in the script? I think, I, or I remember, I think I might have been on the set that day. I, I don't know why. And it, I, it's, he doesn't do this in another episode. I, I want to I ask David about that because I seem to remember him saying that. Uh, we're at the school graduation. Of course, they're ecstatic. They're happy. Meadow graduates. Meadow oh. Mary Angela Soprano. Yep. Tony Carmella in the office. Uh, he takes to uh, Christopher off to the side. I'm oh, wait, but uh, David Scatino at the school, right? Well, uh, first, he talks to, first he talks to Christopher. He takes Christopher over to the That's at the, the house, though. No, no, no. That's at the graduation outside because you see him, uh, Junior, there. At the school. At the school. Oh, all right, and all right. he takes you over to the school. He takes uh, Christopher over, puts his arm around him. I'm a proposal you get your butt. And Christopher says, I fucking deserve it. Got no spleen gene. Because Christopher Got no has spleen. spleen taken out. He sees Junior congratulating Meadow. He goes, oh, oh, oh. Tony goes over. He chases him. Carmela sees you. She's going to cut you a new asshole. Then he sees David Scatino. Getting a cup of coffee. I think part of the reason why he's also making Chris is that Chris had to take care of Richie in the last episode. Chris and Furio, you know. And there's very, no more pussy. Very workmanlike, get it done, you know. Um, the funny the image here, and it's not that funny, it's kind of tragic. Scatino's trying to get coffee that there's nothing left in the urn. That's his life now. Yeah, yeah. It's a metaphor for he was been completely bust out and he's got nothing. He marriage broke up. He's got to leave town and his he's he just tells decimated. He's going to get a job out on a ranch out west. You know what was weird to me? Uh, he said something. You fly into Vegas. He said you fly into Vegas, uh, discount airline or something. It's a half hour away. Vegas isn't a half hour away from. New Mexico. I mean, I, I don't know what that's about. I'm confused a little bit. It's not, no? No. Arizona, no? Yeah, it's close to Arizona, but I don't think it's a half hour. Not a half you know, hour. You know, uh, uh, you know, close. Maybe an hour for I, I, I don't know, a plane ride, but whatever. But of all places, he's talking about Vegas. So he's not cured. <laughs> he's going to be a fuck up. And he's worried that he's going to go to Vegas. And, and, yeah. it, and it just... Just goes on forever. It just keeps rolling along. He's not. That's stopping. true. That's right. Uh, yeah, you see the aftermath. It's a montage. You see David going out of a crappy motel. You see the hotel garbage, garbage truck, garbage. You see the hotel with the Hasid. They destroyed that. There's a junkie in the junkie, lobby. Porno theater. Wabistics is empty. You know, it's like this is the this is the tentacles of Tony Soprano. You know what I mean? And uh, the evils that they do. And and here he is. Everybody else kind of gets affected. Uh, you know, by proxy, his family. Great episode. And then you end with the ocean again. Yeah, great, great episode. Great acting. Oh, great season yeah. two finale. And let me tell you, you know, this show. Here's this picture. I'm going to show it to you now. 
All right. You see that? I don't know if you remember that. Cast that photo, was yeah. cast and crew. Cast and crew 2000. That was the last day by Tony Nesty, the great photographer, Tony Nesty. He was our soprano episode for the first couple of years. Uh, he sent me that. That was the last day of shooting on uh, episode two, season two, I'm sorry. Season two, episode 13. It was the last day. I happened to be there because we were still shooting something from episode 12. So uh, though, I, though I wasn't in episode 13, I happened to be there that day. Uh, I was walking outside of Silver Cup Studios. I had done six episodes. I never said a word. Me and David Chase never spoke. It just never came about. I auditioned for him. Really? I remember being in the bathroom with him. I was uncomfortable to say something. So we were literally, I was going to It was a public way. bathroom, right? It was a, yeah, yeah, a bathroom in Silver Cup. <laughs> a bit, I'm going this way. He's going that way. Literally run into each other. I stick out my hand. I say, Mr. Chase, uh, my name's Steve Sharipa. I play Bobby Bacala. He goes, I know who you are. I said, well, I just wanted to thank you for having me. And he says, oh, you did great. We'll have you back. We'll see Bobby again, which made me feel great. But I didn't speak to him. He wasn't always on the set on Interesting. all my scenes. But I did six episodes. Luckily enough to be there that day, it's an incredible picture. Tony Nesty got up on a ladder, as you can see. All right, you see the picture? It's great. Uh, I'm in it. Lorraine's in it. You're in it. Vinny Pastor's in it. The crew is Jim. in it. Directors, Jim's in it. Eileen Landris is in it. David. Uh, uh, Nancy Marchand's in a chair, front and center. I mean, that is a, a picture to cherish. Uh, uh, Dre is in it. And uh, I just happen to be lucky to be there that day to get in that picture. So uh, I think, you know, season one of Surprise was groundbreaking. It took the world by surprise. But season two surpassed it, I think. I really think. Yeah, and I yeah. think it gets better and better. More characters yeah. come in, and we won't be taking a break. We're going right through, baby. All eighty-six. Right through. Plow ahead to the hundred thousand dollar question, all the way. All right, now uh, uh, it's time for talking Sopranos. Ask me anything segment. The winner of our AMA best question of the week is Carolyn, all the way across the pond in London, England. We are sending Carolyn a pair of Bose headphones. Now, Carolyn asks, Janice's love life. Who do you think Janice would have moved on to next after mourning Bobby's death? She definitely has a type. Love the show. Well, how many Carolyn. relationships did she have? She had Richie? Well, she had she Richie, had but uh, she had, uh, I forget his name, He Turk Pipkin. A terrific right. well, actor. What was the character's name? Remember, he was um, a hippie. Turk he Pitkin. was fantastic. He's right. from Austin, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. What's his name, uh, Andy? Turk, Pip Turk Pipkin's character on The Sopranos. So she was with the Turk Pipkin. Right. Uh, she was with Richie. Richie. She was with Bobby. Bobby. Uh, of course, in an episode. Joey uh, Pants. Joey Pants. Ralphie. She also... Tony talks about her in the episode Blowing Roadies. So uh, Janice has gotten around, obviously. She's gotten around. Now, Aaron uh, Arkaway, played by Turk Pipkin, uh, a great uh, character. Great, great, great character, friend. great guy. Have and you he, heard, what does he say? Have you heard the news or something like that? Is he, he's something <laughs> yeah, like, you know, he was a, he's space a born star, again. Yeah. Space star, hippie, born again. But let's, let's look at this. So, She's also very free sexually, like uh, very liberated sexually. Oh, absolutely. But she's all over the map here. So she's with the hippie. I'm not going in any particular order. Turk uh, with Aaron, born again, hippie, free love, ba ba ba. Couldn't be any more different than Richie, who pure is. Pure evil. <laughs> pure evil she's climbing the country club she wants the big house she wants to be the ultimate mob wife uh, I mean there's nobody like Richie then she moves on to Ralphie 
who's, who's a psychopath, a, another different kind psycho, of psychopath. Sick, a different kind, sexual deviant kind of uh, weird guy, a murderer. <laughs> he killed that girl at the strip club. He was Pro- a demented dude. Probably yeah. the Sopranos whole series worst murder ever. Yes, 100%. Killing that young girl. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, his girlfriend, Rosalie April, he's the one who put the hit out on her son. Right. And then comforted her. Just another horrible son of a bitch. Uh, and then Bobby Bacala, who has two kids. She has a kid a with A widower. Bobby. A nice has a guy. Kid with Bobby. She has, has a, a kid, kid with Bobby. She has a kid. Hey, they Bobby's have a, a sweet house. guy. Sweet Bobby's guy. not a deviant, not a sexual deviant. No. no. He's a missionary guy. Boom, boom. He might only have sex to have kids, Bobby. No pleasure. I don't know about that. <laughs> but, but seriously, he's an innocent, sweet guy, a uh, family man. So uh, is it just... I believe just to whatever comes along is a good opportunity for her. Who's yes. ever, she's an opportunist. So whatever comes along. So I think that the next guy who she would get involved with will be whoever is a good opportunity. She obviously needs to be in a relationship. She's that type of person that needs to be in a relationship all the time. And she got a little taste of it. She wants yeah. the money. She wants the big house. Didn't they lived in Johnny Sack's old house? Didn't they? I believe at the end, a big, really? huge house. She wants that lifestyle. Who could be next? Who's left? So Who? here's the question. Who do you think Janice would have moved on yeah. to next after Bobby? That's what I'm saying. My guess? Paulie, Paulie Walnuts. Paulie Walnuts. Because, you know, he's old school. He's reliable. He's rock solid. He's kind of the only guy left after. Well, no, uh, I mean, by the did. end, who else is left? You have Carlo, played by Arthur Nascarella, right? He might uh, be married though, is he? I'm not sure, but I would say Paulie also. Uh, it's a process of elimination. There's not many people left. There's not many people. Paulie left. Walnuts uh, with the wings. They have the big wedding. If she was going to go for a younger guy, like even a guy younger than her, who would it be? Uh, maybe the, uh, Max Casella character. Maybe Max Casella's character. You think it would be the, the mob guy? The name. Max Casella. Oh, she stays with the mob theme. So Turk, uh, Aaron Arkaway was a one-off. That was a one-off. Bobby was a mob guy, but a nicer mob guy. Richie, a complete psycho, uh, that complete. she knew since childhood. Ralphie, a different kind of psycho. I got to go with Paulie Walnuts. Paulie, me too. Well, we're in agreement. There you go. Paulie Walnuts and Janice. So, uh, they Carolyn, got congratulations. Enjoy your Bose headset. And uh, there you have it. Thanks Come for see listening. us next year when we're in England on our tour. Yes, please do. Thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe to the Talking Sopranos podcast on youtube or wherever you get your podcast follow us on twitter and instagram and like us on facebook and right now you can get official talking sopranos merchandise on talking sopranos.com or through our youtube channel our executive producer is jeff sussman producers andy verderam our music was composed and performed by elijah amaton you could hear more of elijah's music and the band zopa which elijah and i play in together by clicking the links on TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Eric Desi, Bobby Hutch, Frank McKay, Ty Verderam, and Ciara Sharippa. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. Now, I'm very much looking forward to uh, season three. We have some great guests, Catherine Narducci, Charmaine, Jason Sabone, who was Jackie April Jr., Peter Bogdanovich, Elliot Kupperberg, uh, Janice, Aida Totoro, and that's just to name a few. So uh, we got a jam-packed season three coming. Enjoy. Yeah, Pine Barrens. That's going to be fun. All right, my friend. See you later. Talk to you.